Our story begins with the villainess of the story, the beautiful red-haired villain, Rosetta Kazel. She is the youngest daughter of the Duke of Kazel, a powerful family that was deemed untouched even by the Imperial family. Growing up as such, Rosetta got everything she ever wanted, and on the off chance that she couldn't get it, she made sure to destroy it so that no one else could ever have it. Because of this, she became infamous for being a twisted person. But there was one thing the beautiful Rosetta wanted most in this world, and it was none other than the Crown Prince Sihel von Idris. But what exactly made this devilish lady want the prince? Was it because of his beautiful appearance? Or maybe her desire to rise to the top of the empire? Or perhaps it's because the crown prince is hailed as the next owner of the heart of the earth, a jewel that was hidden under the palace. But none of those were the reasons why the young lady wanted him, although it's true that she desired the precious jewel. But more than that, it was Sihel's curse that turned him into a wolf during the full moon that made her want him the most. You see, the crown prince was not fully human, and that made Rosetta want him. A person who could turn into a wolf, because she was fascinated by his rare silvery fur and bright golden eyes. So, to get to him, she decided to become a crown princess, even if she didn't really desire the position. Unfortunately for her, Sihel already has a woman he loves, and since he's part wolf, he's only capable of loving only one person in their lives. Eventually, he ended up choosing his mate rather than Rosetta. Because there was simply no way for him to like her, he decided to choose his lover, which in turn made Rosetta change her ways. If Sihel refused to come to her, she decided that she'd force him to go to her, and the only way to do that was by taking away his position as crown prince. It didn't matter how she did it. What was important for her was to achieve her goal, and Rosetta was bent on destroying what she loved. So in the craziest way, only Rosetta could do it. She pushed Sihel into a corner, developing a creepy obsession and horrible possessiveness that made her want to destroy him, making it the most ideal setting for a villain. It was also because of this setting that Rosetta met her death at the hands of Sihel where she was left all alone after being punished for her evil deeds like most villains are. That was supposed to be the end of the villain Rosetta Kazel, but now the villainess sits in front of her vanity mirror as one of her maids asks if there's a problem. In her mind, there is, because the protagonist of the story woke up to find herself possessing the body of Rosetta Kazel. She couldn't believe her eyes when she woke up and saw her reflection instantly changing into a different person overnight, and what's more, it was the villain of the book she just read. Her heavy sigh comes from the fact that she knew Rosetta would die by beheading in the end, which is something she dreads coming. But from what she's understanding, the real Rosetta died for some reason, which is why she came to possess the villainess's body. Although she's having a hard time trying to understand why she was the one who got sucked into Rosetta's body. The only thing the protagonist is sure of is that she's already dead. She can still remember vividly how it happened then. She was walking in the crosswalk when suddenly, blinking lights from a speeding truck came from her side. Remembering it now, she could still feel the pain that crushed her whole body. Which is why she was ultimately surprised when she opened her eyes and saw that she was no longer in the real world. Her body, which should have been all beaten up and bruised, was unscathed. And when she looked in the mirror, that's when she understood that she was now living as Rosetta Kazel. It has already been a week since the incident happened, and until now she's still not used to living in this body, though she admits that Rosetta's beauty is beyond words. But if she frowns just a little, her gaze turns cold and gives off a scary impression. She got so busy admiring her own face that she forgot the maid beside her, asking if she should change the lady's hairstyle because of her glowering look. That pulled her back into reality, and she told the maid that she liked it and that she should continue braiding it. Although it took some time, the protagonist is now getting used to living as Rosetta, and now that she's given a second shot at life, she's determined to live it in the best way she can. Remembering what happened in the book, she recalls how Rosetta has the perfect life, save for what would take place in the future, and because her character is born with a diamond spoon, she could just live as a rich, unemployed person, something she didn't get to experience in her past life. On the other hand, she doesn't know if this is an equal exchange, living the life of a wealthy villain destined to die, but then again, the original story will start in a month, so she believes she still has a chance to change Rosetta's fate. In the novel, the story begins when the female lead, Liliana, temporarily unleashes the curse of Sihael, who turns into a wolf. Because of this incident, the crown prince imprints Liliana, and later on, the two of them attend the academy together. Rosetta, on the other hand, attended the academy upon her parents' instructions, and this is where she encountered the two of them. From there, Rosetta's obsessive behavior towards Sihel began, which later turned into full-blown anger, 
and because her character will not get to live to see the end, she intends to change that and let her live in the story forever. That was definitely her goal, but fate had a different course in mind, because before she could act on her plan, her brother did something shocking. She was led to the prison cell, where her brother presented her with a big silver wolf with glowing golden eyes, and as far as she knew, there was only one silver wolf in the whole empire, the cursed Prince Sihel. She didn't understand how Sihel ended up here, causing her plan to fall apart, and at this rate, there was a chance that she would die first before the story officially started. Overwhelmed with her brother dumping a silver wolf, none other than Ciel himself. On her, Rosetta sat by the couch feeling exasperated. She looks at the key to the wolf's cage her brother Lanoa gave her, wondering how things turned out like this. Just then, her brother's face flashed in her mind, saying that only the ferocious could tame such a beast, which is why he gave it to her. She sank further into the couch just thinking about it, and said out loud that she thought if she did well, she could have it easy. There's a stark difference between what happened now and what happened in the story since the original Rosetta was the one who hunted Sihel, not Lanoa. In the novel, Rosetta has a hobby of hunting and spots a rare silver wolf. If it were the original Rosetta, then she would have already captured and imprisoned Sihel by now, but she did meet the crown prince before the female lead Liliana. There are some inconsistencies with the story, though, because, for one, no one knew that Sihel was a wolf under a curse. It was this very curse that made him unable to return to his human form, all because he got caught up in the queen's trick to poison him and make his curse spread. Remembering all these, the protagonist remembers that the original Rosetta never saw Sihel return to his human form, but she was able to tell him apart because of his striking eyes. Compared to the other characters, Rosetta had sharper eyes, so when she looked into the cursed prince's eyes, she knew for sure that he was a wolf, which brought her joy, but only for a short time. Soon after this discovery, she saw him and Liliana together, which led her to feel uncontrollable anger and jealousy, which turned to madness in the end. Going back to her current situation, the protagonist knew full well that her meeting with Sihel now would be the beginning of her unhappiness. And just when she thought that he was not here since he didn't appear in the hunting grounds at all, she even made the extra effort of pretending to be sick when the ladies invited her out to hunt because she did not meet him at all, fully believing he managed to escape. But it turns out Sihel was captured by Lanoa. She was surprised to see her brother, especially since no one had seen him for a year. And it was even more shocking that he was the one who captured Sihel. Thinking all about these, Rosetta wonders if she can't change what will happen in the story, no matter how much she tries. Putting all of these aside, she focuses on her current predicament, staring at the key to Sihel's cage, gifted to her by her brother. She threw it across the floor and stood, getting fed up with how noisy the creature behind the cage was, so she walked closer to it, intent on telling it to shut up since her eardrums were about to burst. At first, she was scared once she saw the wolf with her legs trembling, but surprisingly, she adapted quickly to the situation. So now she walks fearlessly to where Sihel is being kept, Rather than be scared, she's more annoyed at how noisy he is, covering her ears as she gets closer and thinking how she feels more pitiful than fearful right now. <coughs> Sihel was panting and glaring at her as she approached and pulled out a chair, sitting right in front of him. She asks him outright if he doesn't like her, and he snarls in reply, growling while Rosetta tells him that she doesn't like him either. Now, she wonders how in the world she is going to communicate with him, mindlessly twirling a lock of her hair as she did so as she remembered that he maintained his rationality after meeting Liliana in the story. She had no idea how he behaved before he turned into a wolf, so she tried communicating with him again, asking if she could release him. He replied with aggressive barks, and seeing that the situation was a bit helpless, she tried bargaining by telling the creature that she'd let him go if he promised not to eat him and urging him to nod if he understood. At that point, Sihail became even more agitated, banging against the bars and baring his fangs for her to see. So eventually, Rosetta gave up and assured him that she wouldn't do anything, so he should just calm down. At this rate, she thought that she might die for real if this kept up. But on the other hand, Sihel looked like a dying male lead for a moment there. Instead of calming down, Sihel continued to be on guard with his fangs out, even with her incessant warning to him, while Rosetta still couldn't figure out if this creature could understand her or not. She does know one thing for sure, she absolutely cannot release him for her own safety, at least not until he turns human. This brings her to problem number two. Only the female lead can cure Sihail's curse, and she won't be appearing after a month, so from the looks of it, she will be stuck with Sihail for the time being. 
Saying that out loud, Rosetta wondered if the creature could understand her since Sahel looked smug just now. Whatever the case, she thought that she would have lifted his curse by now if only she were the female lead, adding that she wouldn't be in such a worrisome situation if only she had that ability from the start. After all, Liliana, the female lead, is an excellent witch who showed exceptional talent in purification. This same purification also had a significant effect on the poison that invaded the cursed prince's body. Remembering what took place in the book, Sihael escaped after being held captive by Rosetta for a month, roaming the northern regions in his wolf form, and that's when he chanced upon Liliana. The female lead was quick to discern Sihael's curse at a glance, so she purified him, making him human instantly. However, the timing was off, or maybe it was due to the fact that the cursed prince spent so much time in his wolf form that he instinctively sensed seductive pheromones from her, which left them doing the deed shortly after. Thinking all about this, the protagonist wondered if another scenario took place wherein Liliana didn't have the ability to purify him and still approached Sihel, then a different event would have taken place, one that ended in screams and the smell of blood, casting all of these aside, whether they like it or not, Rosetta has accepted that she and Sihel have to stay together for a month since they already met each other anyway. And because she's not the original Rosetta who was obsessed with Sahel, she plans to keep the wolf here until it's time for him to find Liliana. With that, she resigned herself to protecting him, at least until the female lead made her appearance in the story. And to make herself feel better, she'll just think of this like she was raising a dog. Turning her attention to Sihel, Rosetta noticed that his wounds were pretty serious, especially the ones inflicted by the assassins sent by the Queen, as well as the ones inflicted by Lanoa, apart from the ones he got from banging against the bars. This made her think that he was quite powerful, lunging at her earlier despite his many wounds, and at the same time, she thought that she had to treat him as well. As for the second part, though, Rosetta's not sure if it will bring her closer to him, but she decides to do so, so she gets up and asks him to wait for a bit. But no sooner had she taken one step than Seahale started barking like mad again, making her angry at the unnecessary noise that rang through the mansion. Just like that, another day has passed, and now Rosetta finds herself carrying a plate full of meat to where Seahel is being kept. The wolf heard her long before he could see her, and surprisingly, he didn't make a lot of fuss as she dropped the plate in front of him and urged him to eat. She took a step back and stood from a certain distance, commenting how nice it would be if he was always this behaved, but he suddenly snarled at her, making her take the food away from him as a form of teasing and further angering Ciel. But she didn't keep at it for too long and gave the plate back, leaning on the wall to watch him eat. Rosetta thought to herself how Ciel didn't even look at the meat because he was cautious of her then, but now the opposite has happened and he completely ignores her. Apart from that, there were several noticeable changes in the past few days as well, and because there's not much to do, Rosetta spends most, if not all, of her time with him because she needs to get close to him. Compared to the first time, she could say that now the two of them are familiar with each other, and in his case, she thinks he sees her more as a food provider, but at least that's something. She really hoped that by giving him food, Zihel would open his heart to her which would lead to him changing how he looked at her. From a noisy and annoying piece of meat, he would see her as a kind meat who provides food for him, but it doesn't really matter since Seahel only views Rosetta as a piece of meat. Another notable change about Seahel is how his incessant barking has decreased. He had been barking non-stop for the past two days, but all of that changed when Rosetta started feeding him. Although she thinks it's partly because Seahel must have started hurting his mouth from the incessant barking, she also thinks that the incident earlier may have played a part in how he's acting right now. Some of the servants did try to tranquilize him to calm him down, but none of those worked and only scared them more, so she's betting that none of them would be coming back there again. Rosetta continues to watch over Seahel as he eats, thinking how this is the most peaceful time of day for the whole mansion. She also noticed that he was pretty tough, seeing how he braved through his wounds, before proceeding to take his plate away since he had already finished eating. As she turned to go, she told him that she'd be back again tomorrow, but the wolf only stared at her retreating figure before closing his eyes to sleep. As soon as she went up to the dining hall, Rosetta was surprised to see Lanoa seated at the table, not expecting this second brother of hers to be back so soon. Sitting opposite her brother, Rosetta asks Lanoa what he is doing here, especially since the other rarely spends time at home. It was not too long ago since he dropped Sahel under her care as well, which was a first for him, while Lanoa also wondered when the last time he spent his time back there was. As the second son of Duke Kazel, 
Lenoa lives his life without much interference because he's far from being the successor. Apart from that, he's also a free soul who spends his time wandering here and there, just about anywhere where his heart beats fast, which is in direct contrast to Rosetta, who spends much, if not all, of her time back in their mansion. It was Lenoa's very free-spirited nature that also deemed him a questionable character in the original story. Now, back to the present, he asks Rosetta if she has already given a name to the wolf, which makes her realize that she has been calling the creature Wolf, or Hay, for the past few days now, and the thought of naming him hasn't even crossed her mind yet. At this, Lenoa suggested that she should do so, and Rosetta asked him for suggestions for the wolf, only for him to throw the chore back in her face, because it's her wolf and not his. Seeing her struggle, Rosetta can't help but ask her brother if he enjoys seeing her like this, which he admits he does, never knowing that he would live to see the day that the great Rosetta Kizel got troubled by a wolf. At this point, she points out that he was the one who brought the wolf, and this time, Lenoa asks her if she wants to give him back. His reply caught her by surprise, since she knows Lenoa is just as bad-tempered as the original Rosetta. If he takes Seahel back, he'll surely harass him just like the original Rosetta did to the poor wolf in the original story. The cursed prince, who later came to be mentioned in the story, never forgave Lenoa for what he did, so he somehow got him expelled from the family, with the latter taking his own life in silence soon after. Their family survived, but Lenoa suffered a gruesome ending. Because of that, Rosetta told her brother that she'd keep the wolf and raise it, while also warning him not to touch it unless he wanted to die. Pleased with her decision, Lenoa went ahead and started eating their meal, but before he could take the first bite, Rosetta grabbed his chin and forcefully shoved a big piece of meat into his mouth, causing him to choke and cough. <coughs> After that, she sat back in her seat, content with her small revenge for the inconvenience he brought upon her these days, while Lenoa kept shouting at her for asking if she wanted to murder him with that. Later that night, Rosetta goes down to the cell where they keep CL, realizing how she has forgotten to give him a name, and was so focused on her earlier meal with her brother. As soon as Sahel heard her coming, he started to become wary of her, and narrowed his eyes as she got closer. Rosetta took a chair and placed it right in front of his cell, telling him that she would now give him a name and react to the ones he liked as she sat. Aside from that, she also told him that she couldn't keep calling him Your Highness or Sihel, so she suggested that he like Albino, but the wolf only turned his head and snarled. She tried Mochi, but only got the same response, so she kept mumbling Sihel, which later turned into Shahel and finally evolved into Shasha. At that, the wolf turned its head while Rosetta came closer and asked if he liked it, and seeing he wasn't reacting violently, she decided to go with that name from now on, which elicited a small growl from the wolf. She was about to ask something from him while thinking that since she had given him a name now, they'd gotten closer, and that maybe she didn't hate him that much after all. Another day passed, and this time, instead of a cold, dark cell, Sahel, who now goes by Shasha, stepped into a brightly lit room lined with a luxurious carpet, sniffing the air as he examined the foreign place. From the side, Rosetta and one of her maids named Marina quietly observed the wolf, with the latter finally settling onto an expensive-looking pillow. Seeing him become cuddly with it, Rosetta smiled so brightly, but it only made her maid frown all the more, with the latter thinking that this was too much princely treatment for a mere wolf. Before all of this came to be, Rosetta had summoned Marina to the cell earlier, instructing the maid to clean the room next to hers, since she intended to give the said room to her new pet. At first, Marina couldn't believe her ears, so she asked her mistress if the room she was referring to was the one next to hers, warning Rosetta that it could be dangerous since there was a chance Shasha could escape. At that, Rosetta replied that they should do their best to make it sturdy, making it so he could not escape from it, and with her most devilish smile, she asked Marina if she would be willing to do it for her. At that point, the maid had no choice but to do as she was instructed, which is what brought about the current predicament. Marina continues to watch over her mistress's reaction, and from what she's seeing, the lady seems pleased with her work for now. So she took this time to approach Rosetta and ask her what they should do with the muzzle if she wanted to put it on Shasha. Upon seeing it, Rosetta remembered that they used to put it on and off when he ate, which was a pretty annoying task, but since the wolf never attempted to escape, she thought it would be all right for them to disregard it for now, while also feeling sorry for shooting him with tranquilizers before. She tells Marina that they should wash it and put the muzzle away for now since she intends to use it when they go out for a walk, leaving the former and the rest of the maids terrified at the mention of the said activity. But Rosetta only told them with a smile that she couldn't keep Shasha locked forever, 
something they would have done a while ago if the wolf hadn't waltzed into the room just now. On the other hand, Marina's shoulders drooped, but her mistress didn't care, adding another instruction for them to make a collar and tag for him, with his name Shasha engraved, as well as to input her address and name on the back of the tag. Marina couldn't believe what her mistress was asking of her, but Rosetta vaguely told her that a lot of people seemed to always want to steal her belongings. At that, Marina's attitude changed, turning darker, and she asked her mistress if she wanted them gone, but the latter told her no, smiling sheepishly at her maid's suggestion. She chuckled because, despite her maid coming from an elite family of assassins, even she couldn't kill the person Rosetta was talking about. After all, she's referring to none other than the Empress. Thinking to herself, Rosetta believes that her maid would have had her throat cut before she could take a step closer to the Empress. Now for the current issue, Rosetta thinks it would be problematic if rumors about a silver wolf were to ensue, even if their location is far north from the government. Still, she couldn't risk rumors spreading, even if it would most likely take a while should one start. Plus, the story is much different from the original, where the Queen got angry and ordered Seahel to be tracked down. On the off chance that the Empress finds out that Seahel is here, she'll most likely send assassins or use her power to catch him. Rosetta believes that she can take on any of the Empress's assassins if that were to happen, but what she really wants is for them not to get involved with her. <sighs> with a sigh, Rosetta hopes things will go well since she doesn't really want to get involved with the Empress, and even if she's forced to take care of the male lead right now, she vows never to give the wolf to her, hell-bent on caring for him so that she could entrust it to the female lead later on. Considering that she doesn't even like the wolf in the first place, Rosetta doesn't have the heart to just abandon him and suffer in the evil empress's hands, even if he had been cursed and became a disobedient wolf. Adjusting to his new place, Shasha sits quietly, side-eyeing the maid approaching, who was carrying his water bowl when he suddenly lunged at her, causing the latter to drop the bowl, spilling its contents. Rosetta, who had been watching him all this time, asked him what his problem was this time and told him that he needed to get rid of the bad attitude he had. The wolf only turns the other way and side-eyes her, as Rosetta starts to tell him off that he seems way more brutal now, just when she didn't use any magic on him out of fear of hurting him. She leans close to him, wagging her finger as she tells Shasha that she's now his master, so he better learn to behave, but the wolf only growled back with a glare, and thus began his incessant, loud barking again, making everyone cover their ears. Marina moved closer to her mistress. But before she could accomplish what she wanted to do, Rosetta sighed and started shouting back at Shasha, who continued to bark, leaving the poor maid stressed at the pair's noise. The two kept at it until Lenoa barged into the chambers, asking his sister to do something about Shasha's barking. At that, Rosetta turned and told him to get out, telling him that she was in the middle of training Shasha. At this, Lenoa asks what exactly she has been training him for, because the wolf is still as noisy as ever, striking one of Rosetta's nerves. So in reply, she angrily countered by pointing out how he was the one who dumped the animal on her while the maids could only look on helplessly. But seeing her brother's agitation, Rosetta urged Shasha to bark more, enough to make Lenoa go deaf, while her older brother could only hand his head, sigh, and cover his ears as the loud barking echoed throughout the mansion. Now Lenoa expresses frustration and regret as to why he gave the wolf to her, while Rosetta continues to laugh over him, finding happiness in her brother's despair at the moment. Just like that, Shasha started occupying the room right next to Rosetta's, although the latter spent much of her time in Shasha's chambers. Now the wolf is fast asleep, cuddling the expensive pillow from before, while Rosetta sits by the couch, looking over at him as she wonders if the method of taming she read would be effective on him. Since then, she has taken to reading a few tutorial books about taming animals, such as From Adoption to Puppy Training, My Crank Dog, What Should I Do, and Wonderful Dog Raised by a Wonderful Master. In the books, the dog master has turned every ferocious dog into a gentle sheep, and it's written by a famous best-selling author, too, so she puts faith in the author, hoping she could fix Seahel's temper. But even after reading all that, Rosetta seems to have hit a dead end, or maybe she's just incapable of applying what she learned in the books. When she tried to teach him how to give his hand, Shasha tried to bite her hand instead. On the other hand, when she tried to teach him how to sit, he just got angry and started barking at her, and thus, the bickering between the pet and the owner ensued. This left her no choice but to bribe him with a large piece of bone to keep quiet in the end. She tried everything there was to do, from getting angry to appeasing to even begging, but the wolf didn't even acknowledge her and continued to act smug and fierce like before. Another week passed, and there was still no development, and her rank in his life was still at the soles of his feet. 
She tried telling him that if he kept up this kind of attitude, they wouldn't be able to go on walks. Shasha, acting as bratty as he is, only ignores her and refuses to listen to her, leaving Rosetta frustrated and torn between locking him up or teaching him. It doesn't help that she needs to send him off in a month, but now that she's thought about it, she really doesn't need to wait a whole month before she can give him away to the female lead. With that, she sat up, deciding right then and there to take a stroll, just in time to bump into one of the maids carrying a plate full of meat. The latter asks the lady where she's going, especially since it's Shasha's feeding time, but Rosetta only tells the other that she should be the one who feeds him because she's off for a walk. This left the maid distressed, while Rosetta gave one last glimpse at Shasha, thinking about how he has always been a bad boy, but she still feeds him because he's beautiful. With that, she tells the maid to be careful not to be bitten and proceeds to exit the mansion. As soon as she was outside, she wondered about the places where she could find Liliana, unsure if the female lead was in the northern region. It also occurred to her that she should just have someone look for her, though she has doubts the female lead could be found that easily, because Liliana has been wandering around for quite a while, so she never stays put in one place for long. Add that to the fact that she's good at hiding and escaping, and Rosetta's pretty sure she won't be found so easily. In conclusion, she knew finding Liliana would be a difficult task, and just then, she heard a scream coming from the mansion, asking for help. Alarmed, Rosetta turned back, wondering anxiously what could have happened before she started full-on running. She's thinking if this has something to do with Sihel, and as if to confirm her suspicions, the door burst open, throwing a few servants to the side. She couldn't believe her eyes, because Sihel had broken free from his chains and was now looking down at her from atop the stairs. At that moment, it dawned upon her that those dark yellow eyes staring back at her right now were proof that they didn't get any closer one bit, despite her attempts to go along with him, because Sihel didn't see her any differently, not one bit. Now he looms over her, looking at Rosetta as nothing but a piece of meat. Time seemed to have slowed down, because she could see the servants and the guards scrambling to fend him off, with Marina and Lenoa running towards her on the other side, as she stood frozen, thinking that she needed to get out of there now. She heard her brother and Marina call out to her, just as Shasha lunged at her, while she braced for impact and curled her fist. Before he could make contact with her, Rosetta smacked Shasha right in the face, making the wolf yelp and knocking him unconscious on the ground. Even Rosetta couldn't believe she did something like that, while Lenoa and Marina stood dumbfounded at what just happened. There's one other important thing that the protagonist forgot about the body she currently possesses. It's a well-known fact that Rosetta has a talent for fighting that's been established long ago. Whether it be a sword, bow, gun, or even a mace, she has a natural talent for fighting that's even better than Ronald, the family's successor. Despite her trashy personality, a lot of expectations are placed on Rosetta by the family, even if her elders see her as problematic and annoying in everything. In the past, Rosetta put her focus on finding things that interested her, rather than being called a genius or the strongest. Whenever she had a problem, the senators could only hang their heads in frustration, asking the lady where it had come from, but her parents stood by her, excusing her actions and telling everyone that these were nothing but the results of her wandering. But once the emperor intervened, they had no choice but to leave Rosetta alone upon his orders, so the young lady was left by herself in the northern region like an unbridled pony. What's even more troubling for the protagonist is the fact that the author of the story didn't describe Rosetta's background in their work. She only learned about it once she possessed Rosetta's body. So now, back to the current situation, it looks like Rosetta's strength is no joke, with the protagonist finding it hard to believe just how physically strong she is. Soon enough, Shasha regained consciousness from being hit earlier, then proceeded to attack her again, but this time, Rosetta was ready for him. As soon as he lunged toward her, she jumped and rode his back. She kept on shouting at him to stay still and ordered Marina to bring his muzzle, which the maid hurriedly attached to him. The maid managed to put it on him just in time for him to throw Rosetta off his back, immediately moving over to step on her, which she managed to evade in time by rolling to her side. As she turned, she gave him a hard kick, knocking him out again while Rosetta looked over him, assessing that he wouldn't be able to get back up after receiving a hit like that. Before he could get up, Rosetta chose to carry him over her shoulder, leaving all the servants in awe of just how strong she was. Apart from that, knowing she was this powerful only made her feel mortified when she remembered how she begged for him back then. Lenoa was the only one unfazed by everything that happened, congratulating her for a job well done as he welcomed her inside. 
But more important than that, he told her that she needed to prepare a cage for him, with Rosetta getting angry at how that was the only thing he could say after he saw her fight off Sihel earlier. But before she could make a snarky remark, Lenoa reminded her that the beast was hers and that she should watch over it carefully. She couldn't believe him saying things like that, so she ought to have chased and kicked him if only she wasn't carrying Sahel right now. Casting the thought aside, Rosetta knew she had better things to do, so she instructed one of the maids to bring the therapist to Shasha's room as she looked over the damage her pet wolf had done inside the mansion. Sihel was soon put back inside his cage, where he regained consciousness. Looking at this cage like this, Rosetta found it strange that the cage wasn't damaged, nor was the lock broken, which made her wonder just how he managed to escape. So she asked the wolf, who only hung his head low, his muzzle still attached to him as he moved back. Seeing his reaction, she's pleased to see that he no longer sees her as a piece of meat, but as someone to fear. She asks him if he could tell her what happened, stressing that she is his master, as Shasha replies in a small bark. Soon after, an investigation took place, determining the culprit behind what happened. Based on their findings, the servant serving food for Shasha that day was the one behind his escape. Just as she approached his cage, she noticed that there was an expensive item in one of Sihel's toys, and because of her greed, she chose to open his cage, leading to the wolf's escape. Of course, this misdeed did not go unpunished, and Lenoa had the maid's hand cut off. He was sure to have done more if not for Rosetta quietly dismissing the maid. Knowing her brother's personality, he would have done a lot worse. And because Rosetta has a lot on her plate right now, she just chose to let the maid be, not caring whether she lived or died. So now, with renewed fervor, Rosetta is back to coaching Shasha. And even though a week has passed, he still shows a bit of stubbornness. Fortunately for her, she only needs to give off a semi-threatening aura to remind the wolf just who his master is. So now he easily folds to her commands. With Shasha finally giving his paw as she signals hand, Rosetta gives him a plate of his favorite meat as a reward. The training has been progressing pretty smoothly, but a new problem presented itself to her. Shasha has been gaining a little too much weight recently, and it shows especially on his abdomen. After eating, she suggested they take a walk, with the wolf tilting his head in wonder as she told him that he should go out and play a little in addition to his need to lose weight. She caressed his growing belly to emphasize the fact, and Shasha was quick to react aggressively, fully aware that he too knew that he had gained quite a bit of weight. So with a forlorn look, she apologizes to him in her mind, intent on making him fit so he could go and meet the lead heroine in his best shape in a few weeks. The schedule of their walks became a daily habit, and soon, Shasha was even the one who initiated it, getting overly excited as he ushered Rosetta to fetch his leash. But as soon as she takes the nuzzle, Shasha becomes stubborn again, refusing to wear it, while Rosetta stresses that he needs to if he wants to go on a walk with her. This time, she tries bribing him by praising him, calling him a good boy, as she tells the wolf that good dogs must wear muzzles, which he soon caves into. Outside, Shasha explores the vast greenery of their garden, sniffing a certain flower through his muzzle when he suddenly raises one of his hind legs to pee on the said flower. Seeing the cursed prince act like this just reminded her that wolves really do things like that. But what was troubling her was the way he was looking toward her, a bit embarrassed, as he was about to do the act. Just then, she remembered the content of the book she read, and that when dogs are about to do something embarrassing, they turn to their masters, asking to be protected. At that, Rosetta's eyes shined brightly as she assured Shasha that she would protect him, but this only seemed to have made the wolf even more embarrassed. She couldn't help but smile fondly, seeing him act like this, and hearing him tell her through his eyes not to stare too much, when suddenly he started running towards something and forcefully pulling her with him because of the leash she held in her hand. Shasha ran with such ferocity that Rosetta could only tell him to stop, and that's when he stopped right in front of a tree and started barking toward the branches. Looking up, she saw that he was barking at one of the crows as she held on to him and tried to make him calm down. But the wolf refused to do so, glaring at the animal on top as Rosetta sighed exasperatedly at his sudden attitude. So she picked a nearby branch and tried to shoo away the crow, but the animal only stared back at her intently until she grew annoyed and started hitting the branch harder. At that, the crow flew away while Shasha continued to growl at its retreating figure, so she tried to calm him down again this time. Later that day, Rosetta narrates to Marina how Shasha barked like crazy toward a crow, just as the maid was brushing her hair. And upon hearing that, the latter told her mistress that it should be natural because wolves like to hunt. 
This confused Rosetta for a bit, so Marina explained that wolves are animals that hunt to live, but because he's been in captivity for a while, he must have been under a lot of stress. Hearing her say that made Rosetta all the more insecure, so she decided to go take a look at him as soon as the maid was done styling her hair. She arrived just in time because one of the maids ushered her to come to take a look at the state of his chambers, where everything was in disarray. Rosetta approached his cage and was surprised to see him with a forlorn look, and that's when it made her wonder if he was bullied by a crow when he was younger. If that were the case, then this may be the reason why he's showing such an anxious image toward her right now, which is why she tries to calm him down. She moves closer, opening her arms as she coaxes him with good compliments, with Shasha gingerly taking small steps forward. She was about to welcome him into her arms, when the wolf ran past her. Rosetta got annoyed for falling for his tricks, shouting at him to come to her, but she was surprised to see him settle on her bed instead, and once again, the lady couldn't help but find his antics cute while Marina started fuming at this crazy dog. She quickly instructed Marina to bring her a new mattress, and as soon as she got it, Rosetta approached Shasha, telling him to come down from her bed. She even promised to let him sleep in her room if he behaved well. While Marina cautioned against this idea, fearing that it might be too dangerous since he did try to harm him a while back, but the young lady said it was fine. This time, the maid asks her what would happen if he attacked her while she was sleeping, and before Rosetta can answer, Marina suggests that she at least put a muzzle on him. Thankfully, the young lady agreed and said she could put it on him before they went to sleep, since there was no need to do so right now because he was calm. But Marina cannot be deterred and is intent on keeping her mistress safe, so she tells her that she will stand by her side and protect Rosetta, which the latter agrees to. Rosetta and Shasha's relationship continued to improve, and it came to a point where the wolf now stood by her wherever she went. During one meal with Lenoa, her older brother asked if she takes Shasha with her everywhere she goes, to which she replied that she only lets him leave her side at night. He seems amused at her answer, then pointedly asks just what's sitting on her feet right now, and Rosetta says that it's none other than her adorable Shasha. Seeing her sister's changed behavior, Lenoa wondered out loud where the old Rosetta, who used to hit animals to make them stronger, had gone. She responded by saying that she's already changed her ways because she now realizes all the mistakes she made in the past and will start living truthfully from now on. Lenoa choked on his teeth, finding it hard to believe that these very words were coming out of her mouth and that she didn't sound normal. Rosetta took offense at what he said, so she quickly ordered Shasha to bite his brother, to which the wolf readily obliged. But before he could sink his teeth into the man, there was a knock on the door. All three of them turned to see who it was and were greeted by a tall man with short black hair wearing spectacles, Baron Pallia Principality, the retainer that governs the Principality. Lenoa was the first to greet the Baron, while the latter turned his attention toward the snarling wolf in front of him, commenting how he had never seen a wolf like that before. Baron Pallia is a man of many things. He's Lenoa's agent, a wandering tourist, the one with the governing authority in the kingdom, and for Rosetta, a problem. He was the only one who constantly nagged her, leading to Rosetta getting fed up with him, as she ignored his greetings and stayed mad at him. But the thing is, she's no longer the Rosetta he knew, but an entirely different one. Now, onto the current situation. Shasha snarls at the Baron, and before he can do anything to their guest, she explains that she's raising the wolf, asking the other to keep quiet about it. The Baron agreed, but Rosetta didn't miss the way he looked at her just then. It was the same one the maids had when she told them that she would be raising a dog like Sihel. But rather than mull over it, the Baron was quick to talk business, telling Lenoa that he came to report about the mining project and produced a big stone jewel, which he put on the table. Rosetta was surprised to see the item, wondering if it was what she thought it was, while the Baron explained that the last time he saw a diamond was a week ago, and now the only stones they were able to mine were the ones he showed them. Lenoa commented that it was a fail, and once again Rosetta noticed how somber the atmosphere was, with her brother further commenting on how useless the stone was just as she approached it. She grabbed hold of the stone and told both men that it was not useless, it was a magic stone worth a lot of money, much to their shock. Seeing their reaction surprised her even more. She was not aware that they didn't know this was actually a magic stone. In the original novel, the dukedom was famous for its magic stone, so she assumed that it was pretty common knowledge among the people and the characters. The Baron couldn't believe what he heard, mentioning that the blue luster jewel was the one they considered a magic stone, and Rosetta explained that the one he was talking about was a machined stone, whereas the one in her hand was a raw stone. 
He then asked how she knew that, and she explained that a witch explained it to her once back then, but in her mind, she didn't know the name of the magic stone. Speaking of witches, the Baron vaguely remembered that Rosetta sponsored a certain witch last year, and she was quick to explain that the witch she sponsored was quite proud of the rare rough stone, which looks exactly like the one they have right now, though this one is a bit bigger. Rosetta added that if they still didn't believe her, they should go and check to verify it, which the Baron said he would. Lenoa only smirked, asking why she was suddenly acting out of character like this, while Rosetta turned to the Baron, commenting how she always knew that he looked at her as someone useless. At that, the Baron replied that he still hasn't forgotten how he spent a lot of money solving the problems she caused in the past, which made him wary of her now. However, he does admit that he's pleased to see that Rosetta has undergone a change in attitude and is living a decent life these days. He continued nagging her for many other things, which made the protagonist finally understand why he and the original Rosetta didn't have a good relationship in the story. Just then, she turned to a yawning Shasha and used him as an excuse to get away from the two, excusing herself as she reasoned that her wolf needed to go for a walk now. She was about to make a speedy escape, but he managed to stop her again, saying that there was one more important thing she needed to know. With a frown, Rosetta wondered if he would continue his nagging, so imagine her surprise when he informed them that rumors were spreading about the crown prince disappearing. At that, Lenoa mentioned that the crown prince used to venture here and there, while the Baron added that the little duke was secretly looking for him. Hearing that, Lenoa said right then that the rumors must be true, and the Baron backed it up by saying that they must have encountered some problems. Rosetta was quiet while the two men continued to share theories. In her mind, she was busy thinking about the multiple problems the disappearance of the Crown Prince had brought. There's the fact that Lenoa hunted and caught the said prince, injuring and tying him in chains in the process to boot. If the Crown Prince doesn't return by next month, they have no choice but to conduct Rosetta's coming-of-age ceremony right there in the mansion. When she heard this, Rosetta finally realized why the two of them were seriously discussing this topic since it concerned her upcoming birthday after all, but she told them she had no problem if ever that were to happen and quickly left before the Baron could say another word. Linoa was surprised, expecting her to get angrier if her coming-of-age ceremony took place in their mansion, but Rosetta heard it, telling him again that she's a changed woman now. Lenoa expected a grumpier reaction from her because, in the original story, Rosetta's coming-of-age ceremony was celebrated grandly in the palace, but because of the crown prince, they had to do it on the territory in far simpler terms. She's sure the old Rosetta would have gone mad if that were to happen, but because she possesses her body now, she couldn't care less about the said event. And the sooner the ceremony draws near, the sooner she has to part with Sihel. Turning to him, she tells the wolf that she's sure she'll find her way back somehow, and as long as Liliana shows up, everything can revert to the original storyline. She thought she managed to get away from the Baron once she and Sihel were outside, but too bad for her, the man was as persistent as ever, even though she tried her best to ignore him. But Baron Pelia is tenacious. He kept following closely behind her, asking the lady of the house to check something for him, even when she flat out told the guy that she was busy and did not want to be bothered. Now she realized the real reason they end up fighting every time they meet is because of her brother. He keeps shoving his other duties onto her, filling Rosetta's plate with other responsibilities that he should have been attending to. Now Rosetta grows more annoyed at the Baron, with each passing second he spends pestering her. She thought it was enough that she thanked him for solving all her problems back then, but asking for help for something is an entirely different matter, which she refused to do. So instead, Rosetta focused on playing with Shasha, picking up two balls and throwing them high in the air as the wolf quickly followed suit while at the same time kicking dust right into the Baron's face. Instead of retaliating or getting angry, he kept quiet and knew that she wanted him gone for reasons he didn't know. As for Shasha, he managed to retrieve the red ball and saw that the blue one went over the fence just as the Baron approached his master, with the latter telling the man that she shared the same thoughts as his and to leave her alone. But the Baron refused, citing that the reason why is because Rosetta is the only one who knows about these magic stones, which means that she can be his only trading partner, and there's no better person to occupy such a position. At this point, Rosetta told him that she didn't even know the first thing about business, while thinking in her mind that she only wanted to show Lenoa a few outsourcing companies. The Baron taking an interest in her as his business partner is something she did not foresee and something she regrets because the man is hell-bent on getting an opinion out of her. In her mind, she tries to argue with him to just do as he pleases, 
because she wants to spend the rest of her time with Shasha rather than with him. Speaking of Shasha, that's when Rosetta noticed that her wolf hadn't returned from retrieving the balls she threw earlier, so she turned to look for him just in time for her to see him jumping over the fence. Both she and the Baron stood frozen for a moment before she started to panic and called after him. In her mind, the best time for Sihel to run away is after Liliana arrives in the north, and running away now is not the best option. She calls out after the wolf, telling him to come back because if he leaves now, it will be very hard for her later on. Rosetta did not hesitate to run after her pet and follow Shasha, shouting for the wolf to come back while the Baron tried to call her attention. She ignored him and continued pursuing the animal, all the while regretting how she took her eyes off him for a second and got too complacent because he'd been behaving pretty well recently. She kept on calling for him, worried that he might get run over by a carriage and get seriously injured or even be bullied by suspicious people, fueling her anxiety even more. So it came as a complete shock to her when the wolf jumped back the way he came, carrying the blue ball into his mouth and dropping it right at her feet. She looked over him, asking the animal if this was the ball she threw earlier, but in her mind, she was processing the fact that he didn't run away. And just when she thought he hated her too, and it turns out he only really ran after the ball and not to run away. And to prove it further, Shasha leans over her legs and nuzzles his face against her. In turn, she rewarded him with neck scratches, praising Shasha for doing a job well done in retrieving the ball, signaling the first time Rosetta felt that she and Sihel got closer. This time for sure, she knows it's not only one-sided, and he has grown to like her, which is why she kept showering him with words of affection. Just then, Shasha lunged toward her, and the two started rolling by on the grass, just in time for the Baron to walk in on them snuggling together. Seeing him approach, Rosetta got up and asked why he hadn't left yet, and the Baron produced a handful of documents, handed them to her, and said that he still had a lot of things to say to her. She could only frown, telling him that he was quite persistent, but the other even took pride in it, commenting that it was one of his strong points. Rosetta started flipping over the pages, scanning the contents, as the Baron stood over her as she breezed through the account of the accessories she made out of magic stone. As for Duke Kazel, he will be the one to deliver the goods to the jewelry store owned by himself, and on the next page, she read that magic stones are quite hard to handle, so it's much better to send them to a famous company, but the cost is pretty high if they choose to do so. She asks the Baron if there's anything else he wants to share, and like she thought, he says that the cost is quite expensive, but the craftsman cannot use any gems. She's caught in a pickle since she knows the craftsman also needs to make as much profit as possible, but the cost is too high. At the same time, she's already thinking long-term, with the profit from the said gems serving as her retirement. And at that, an idea popped into her mind. She told the Baron to call the Asila factory, and despite being one of the lesser-known companies, she vouches for their quality of work and proceeds to share how Countess Carell wore a notable necklace from His Majesty's birthday last year that was actually made by them. The Baron was surprised to know such an accessory was made by them because the Countess's necklace was so famous that the Baron immediately bought it the first time he heard about it. What's more, the necklace is also very beautiful and also doubles as a magic stone, making it the only one in the world. The Countess's necklace got so popular that it's even pretty well known in the Far North territories. But back to the situation, the Baron curiously asked how she knew all of this. Rosetta smiled and simply told him that it was gemiferous, but in truth, she knew that the original Rosetta was fascinated with beautiful things, including beautiful gems. In the book, once she heard about the Countess's necklace, she immediately met up with all of her subordinates to go to the goldsmith's place. With that, her discussion with the Baron wrapped up since the cost would be satisfactorily paid. However, Rosetta warned him that the owner of a Sila factory does not like attention and that he should expect to find it hard to secure a contract with him, casually mentioning how she also got rejected by him beforehand. The Baron then asked if the person behind such craftsmanship was still alive, to which she said yes, saying in her mind that if it weren't for her talent, Asila would have died sooner. With a determined look, the Baron turns to her and asks Rosetta to place her belief in him, but she only stares at him, wondering why he's making it look like he's reporting to a general from the battlefield. But she bade him goodbye soon, with Shasha right by her side, as she thought to herself that it would be so much better if they never met again. As she turned, it was his turn to be bewildered by the young lady, seeing her smile for the first time in ages and even shouting for the wolf earlier. She screamed not out of authority but rather out of sincere worry and anxiety. He remembered what her father said back then about how she lost track of her path, 
but the Duke didn't blame her. Everyone experiences something like that. But hers just took a while longer than the others, with the Duke fully believing that she would come to her senses in the end. As the Baron walked away, he thought about how he believed that the young lady knew nothing about the world, but it turns out he's the one who sees the world naively. With a smile, he said that he would try to teach her business next time, thinking it wouldn't be so bad as the previous times. That night, Rosetta settled into her bed more tired than usual, thanks to the Baron's nagging. What's even worse is that he kept coming back, even when she explicitly told him to leave her alone, wondering just how long she had to put up with him. Just then, Sihel nudges her feet with his nose, trying to comfort her, which she thanks him for. He turned to her, giving a small cry that made her feel pitiful since she didn't expect him, of all things, to take pity on her. But she decided to let it go and lay in bed, bidding him good night. Later that night, there was a lot of barking and snarling, but Rosetta refused to wake up, annoyed at the dog's noises. And when he refused to stop, she opened her eyes to see him fighting off a couple of assassins, making her sit up in bed. But as soon as she did, one of them lunged toward her. Rosetta sat frozen in her bed as her assailant reached out his hand, when suddenly, Shasha came from the side with his fangs bared. He bit into the man, who let out a scream, with the wolf immediately turning to his master to check if she was okay. Rosetta apologized for being so absent-minded and quickly grabbed the sword by her bedside, telling herself that it was not time to be like this. As one of the assassins drew his blade to stab Sihel, Rosetta struck him down, followed by the others, and their blood splattered her floor. Ten assassins were sent to her, wherein one person got killed and four others were taken out by Shasha, with five more on their feet. With a glare, she asked them who sent them here, but she was met with silence. She then asks who wants her dog, and since they still refuse to answer, she has no choice but to threaten them with death. In the end, Rosetta took all of them out, annoyed at such a disturbance just when she was sleeping soundly. On the other hand, Shasha was busy staring at something outside from her balcony, which she also looked into. And that's when she noticed the crow, perched on the branch opposite her balcony. She was quick to discern that it was the same crow Shasha was barking at last time, making her wonder if this creature belonged to the Empress and had been following them all along. So Sihel already knew from the start that the crow was the Empress's spy, which is why he got so angry at the time. At that, Rosetta quickly turned to her heels, dropping her sword. She came back carrying a rifle and immediately fired at the bird, which she caught in time, right before it took flight. The animal fell with a thud as Rosetta finally realized that it was the crow's fault that revealed Sihel's whereabouts to the Empress. She felt bad for acting careless like this, especially since she knew the Empress used her magic to control the birds. But now that the bird is taken care of, she drops the rifle and gives Shasha a hug, assuring the wolf that everything is fine now. As she was petting him, she realized that he got injured from the fight, so she quickly took one of her blankets to wipe off his blood, feeling sorry for his state, all because he had protected her earlier. Still, he feels thankful for him because if he didn't bark, she wouldn't have woken up from her sleep, and now she feels bad at how she lacks concentration, telling him all of this is her fault. As she sighed, Shasha licked her face, feeling a slight sting on her face. She hadn't noticed that she got cut earlier as well, but she was surprised since this was the first time that Shasha licked her face. It made her wonder if he was worried about her. She gives him a hug and pats her neck, telling him that she'll protect him, though she's even more surprised that he's not shying away from her embrace because he usually does so whenever she gets near. Holding his head in both hands, she asks if he feels scared because of the Empress and assures him that she will be the one to protect her from him. There was a moment of silence before the wolf spoke and asked her how she knew the Empress was behind the attack. Rosetta froze before pushing him back and screaming in surprise. She also put some distance between them, asking if he's a talking dog, and to that, he clarified that he's a wolf and not a dog. She couldn't believe this development, because in the original story, this thing didn't happen at all. After all, once he turned animal, he lost all human consciousness. He couldn't even talk after meeting Liliana back then. She stood in shock at this insane development, which made her think about how acting like a villain and taking care of Sihel is like a ticking time bomb. But the fact is, she still couldn't believe that he knew how to talk. He spoke again, telling her to answer him, pushing her down as he asked Rosetta how she knew about all these things. And in her panic, she hit him right in the face. This sent the wolf flying, and Rosetta quickly apologized since she was surprised at what he did. She hangs her head, saying how she has been a bad master, but Sihel has already recovered and is walking toward her, saying she treats him like a dog. Now, she realizes that she's no longer a dog, so she asks how he can talk. 
The wolf answered that he had no idea and asked her again to answer his question since this was the third time he had asked it. Rosetta told him that it was because of the crow, explaining that she heard before how the Empress could command crows, so she thought that the same crow from before used to follow them. At that time, she already felt strange, but what she didn't expect was for the Empress to send assassins her way, thinking that Shasha felt strange too. She then asks him if he's the Empress's dog or wolf since the Empress sent her assassins for him, feigning innocence about knowing his real identity. This annoyed the wolf, telling her that she should stop saying nonsense, while Rosetta could only be surprised, not expecting that Shasha could make a real human-like expression. She thought that she needed to keep quiet until Sihel revealed his identity, and she couldn't really tell him that she knew she was taking care of the crown prince since it would make her suspicious. Just then, he called out her whole name, making her turn to him to ask if he knew who she was. The wolf affirmed, saying he knows her very well because her reputation precedes her, a crazy person who unchained a dog. He also mentions that the fact that she's here only means that he's in the Duke's territory, which works in his favor, explaining that he needs to talk to her. Without skipping a beat, the wolf reveals to her that he is the crown prince of the Empire, Sihel von Idris, who was cursed, so now he's forced to live in this form. There was a deafening silence as a million thoughts ran inside her head, but she still couldn't believe how he easily revealed this secret to her, telling him in her mind that he shouldn't reveal things like this to anyone. It took a full moment before the words sank into her, and as soon as they did, Rosetta started panicking, asking just what it was he said. In her mind, she couldn't help but feel embarrassed since she started talking to him with honorifics now, but Sihel calmly replied to her that he could only rely on her right now, though he was a bit surprised that she accepted his revelation a little too easily. She told him that it's not hard to do so, although she was quick to say that the maltreatment he received may have been a little too harsh. Sihel replied that her personality was quite different from what he expected since he thought she would be much more aggressive, then proceeded to ask how he got into the Duke's mansion. This surprised her, and she asked in retrospect if he didn't remember just a little bit about how he ended up there, but Sihel told her that he couldn't, tilting his head to ask if there was a problem with that. She suddenly beamed at what he said, praying that he wouldn't ever recall what happened to him, because if he found out everything that had happened since then, then, she was pretty sure that she'd get arrested for insulting the royal family. With him not remembering anything at all, Rosetta decided to fill in for him, explaining that her second brother Lenoa brought her here because he got injured, thinking to herself that she'd get away with a lie saying that she was out on a hunt. Sihel accepted her explanation easily, but quickly followed up with another question, asking her if they were breeding him to eat later on. At that, she took offense, asking how he could think of such a thing when she had been raising him with all her heart. All his food was quality meat. He slept on top-notch quality cushions, and he even took walks every day. She also stressed that he had no idea just how hard it was to raise him, and at her answer, his tail started to wag a bit, saying that he was pleased because the rumors he heard about her being vicious must be true. Even if he was in his wolf form, Rosetta could hear the amusement in his voice, wondering if he was making fun of her right now and where the cute puppy she once had was. She turned sour, asking if His Highness wanted to be kicked out, and Sihel seemed to panic, telling her that he doesn't, at least not like this. Suddenly, Marina and the other guards came bursting through the door, making Rosetta put a hand over Sihel's mouth to silence him. She whispers close to him, signaling him to keep quiet now that her servants have arrived. She then turned to her maid, saying they came right on time since she was just about to call them so they could clean up all this mess. Marina approached her gingerly, asking if the young lady was all right, and Rosetta assured her that she was, because Shasha was the one who protected her earlier and got injured in the process. But Marina's brows furrowed, seeing her mistress have a wound on her cheek, exclaiming that a scar has now tarnished the national treasure's face and that she needs to be treated right away. Rosetta could only try to calm her down, finding the national treasure face a bit excessive, but Marina was undeterred, this time calling it a holy relic, if not a national treasure. Someone almost burst out laughing hearing that but managed to stop it at the last minute, making the guards look over to where the sound was coming from and failing to notice a trembling seahull, the source of the sound. Rosetta's head falls to her hands, embarrassed at hearing what they had to say about her face, so she decides to change the topic and tells the maid that she'll just wash her face right now because she finds it sticky. Later, when everything has been cleaned up, the events of this night alone become too much for Rosetta, who has the strength of steel especially with the addition of a talking seal. 
She was too tired as Sihel started asking her a few more questions, like how many days he had been staying with them and what the current state of the capital was since he disappeared. She tried to answer these to the best of her ability, but it seems that she has reached her limit and is now feeling on the verge of passing out. So before the wolf could ask any more questions, she told him that she was her puppy and that she even put a cute tag around his neck, indicating that she was his owner. In answer, Sihel told her that it was difficult to assert ownership during the first meeting, but she explained that she has been raising him for almost a month now, making her qualified for it. And as his master, she orders him to ask the rest of the questions tomorrow, falling asleep as soon as her head hits the pillows. Rosetta soon settled into a deep sleep, with Sihel watching over her sleeping figure. He thought how she was much different based on the rumors he heard, because they'd been saying that she had a violent temper, enough to kill someone. Her reputation was so notorious that it even reached the battlefield, though knowing rumors, it's bound to be exaggerated. But if one were to look at Lenald's attitude, whose face hardened at the mention of her younger sister, it seems that there's some semblance of truth in it. Still, the crown prince found out through her voice and a warm hug that she's no one tyrannical. He doesn't even see her as someone he needs to put out, though the fact that they spent a good whole month together may also be the reason why he feels so mellow toward her. The image of Rosetta saying she was his owner made him smirk since he did find her interesting. He was about to settle into bed but noticed that his cushion was on the floor, and being a proud royal, he chose to sleep on her bed instead for the simple reason that the crown prince does not sleep on a dog's bed. Rosetta woke up in the morning thanks to the noises she heard, wondering just what those were when she decided to just sleep on it more. However, Sihel already saw her open her eyes, towering above her body, as she tried to tell him that she'd talk to him in two hours. But instead of talking, Sihel only barked, leaving her confused about the events of last night were nothing but a dream, because it seemed that he had reverted to being a dog again. She finds it hard to discern if he's talking to Shasha or Sihel right now, when suddenly, he bares his fang right into her face and bit her lip. Rosetta's mouth started bleeding, and the wolf started to lick her face, making her wonder if he had lost his mind. His actions jolted her awake, making her ask angrily just what he was doing while C. Hell exclaimed satisfactorily. She couldn't understand why he did something like that, so she hit him lightly on the head, asking why he bit her lip, and he answered by asking if she was normally this violent. She asked if it was normal to just let him do whatever he wanted with her lips while sleeping, asking again why he bit her, and the wolf answered that he was simply hungry. His answer drew a disgusted reaction on her face. She wondered if he was some kind of pervert, with Sihel trying to explain that it was not like that at all. When he woke up, he couldn't speak at first, and was about to wake her up when he smelled just how good her lips were. So she asks him instead if he saw her as prey, while wondering what she needs to do since she almost got ranked above him. She considered beating him up again, narrowing her gaze toward him, but Sihel continued with his explanation from earlier. He said that he thought he would be able to speak again once he drank her blood, but Rosetta only grew more suspicious of him, crossing her arms in defense. The crown prince then pointed out that he was able to start speaking when he ingested her blood last night, and even today too, which made her remember him licking her cheek last night, which made him come to his senses. So she questions herself if her blood holds some kind of special power, a similar purifying power akin to Lilalana's. But she quickly cast the thought away, thinking that if she did, then he should have already turned back into a human by now, and she was soon distracted from this thought, when Sihel towered above her and asked if he could lick the rest of her blood. She backed away, raising a hand over her face as she tried to cover up, and told him that he was still a man, even if he was currently in wolf form, to which he asked if she only noticed that just now. In her mind, she doesn't really have any feelings toward him because he's in a different form right now, though she admits that it would be problematic if she started to have feelings for a dog later on. But back to the situation at hand, she tells him that he could just bite her finger if he wants to drink her blood next time, and warns him not to bite her lips anymore, because doing so only makes them greasy. Her reproach downed his spirits, as he told her with downcast ears that he just didn't want to hurt her, while Rosetta could only think that she needed to pay more attention to him now. With a sigh, she asks him if he still needs more of her blood, and he beams, saying that he does. Seeing his reaction made her a bit silly for feeling sorry for him just now, but she decided to just give him what he wanted. She got a small knife and pricked her finger, then proceeded to place it right in front of him. Sihel quickly started licking her blood, making her feel a bit weird at how he looked like he found it delicious. 
Once he's done, she asks him what he plans to do next, and His Majesty answers that he intends to contact Ronald first. She wasn't surprised at his course of action, seeing as the only person they could trust right now was definitely the one who knew about his curse, and he was also the only one who was blood-related to her. While still licking her blood, she asks him how he plans to contact Ronald and is met with silence and a pointed look. At that moment, Rosetta wondered if the cursed prince wanted her to do it in his stead, so she went ahead and asked angrily if she was one of his subordinates. But Sihel promised her that he would do anything she wanted if she granted him this request, something she was quick to jump onto. And without wasting another second, she tells him that she's ready whenever he is. So with that, His Majesty instructed her to write a letter addressed to Ronald. In the letter, he briefly explained to the other man that Sihel is currently staying at the Duke's mansion, urging him to come quickly. Just as Rosetta signed Sihel's name at the end of the letter, she found something amiss, and as the cursed prince approached to ask what it was, she took one of his paws, telling him that they should at least provide proof that the letter did come from him. Sihel lets Rosetta imprint his paw on the paper, telling him that it's not such a bad idea and that the two of them are in the same boat from now on, so he should just call her Rosetta later. They shook on it, and she believed that as long as they were bound, they should treat each other decently in this relationship. As for the young lady, she gave the letter to her butler, instructing him to send it to her brother Ronald, and that it was an urgent matter, so he should make haste. The older man agreed, but he also couldn't help but give Rosetta a worried look, something she was quick to notice. She asks him if there is something wrong, and the butler points out that she looks hurt, saying that the young master got angry last night because she got hurt. She was surprised that Lenoa felt as such, and the older man even mentioned that he could hear some of the knights being punished finally understanding that the noise she'd been hearing since early morning came from the knights. Her butler seems to be concerned for her and tells her that maybe she should try some of the medicinal herbs they have this time, even though he knows she usually says no to these things. At that, she asked if he was talking about the tonic because, if he was, she planned on drinking it later and urged him to make one for her. Her words brightened the older man's state. He got teary-eyed as he told her that he would bring it to her every day, vowing to himself that he'd take better care of her health from now on. After talking with the butler, she turned and walked away, wondering why Lenoa had not come to see her even when the butler said he was very worried about her. She made her way to the training grounds and saw many of the knights now either down on their knees or sitting on the floor while Lenoa sat and observed them. He was so absorbed in his own thoughts that he failed to recognize her presence and he did so when she tapped her shoe. As soon as he turned in her direction, she asked him why he hadn't gone and seen her when he was so worried, but her older brother only stared at her. With a sigh, he cast his head down and commented how she looked messy, but she told him this was nothing. So instead, Lenoa vented his anger at the knights, screaming at them for stopping mid-run, while Rosetta asked why he made them roll around like that. To this, he explained that if the knights could still sleep when a mouse crawled in, then it was only natural that they would have to practice more and do better. Furthermore, he finds it annoying that she could crawl out even after handling the mouse, then proceeds to ask if Shasha got hurt badly. She told him that he didn't, though he did get tired of protecting her. Still, Lenoa praised him in a way, saying that the wolf did a better job at protecting her than some people. Suddenly, he turned serious and told her that she should bring her bodyguard with her from now on, an idea she didn't find too enticing, asking why she should. To that, he told her angrily that it was because of her cracked lips, asking who dared beat her. Seeing her brother's angry reaction, Rosetta tried to explain that she only got this injury when she was playing with Shasha, making him disappointed at how her pet could bite her now. Because of that, he starts nagging at how she grew weaker recently, saying that she lost all her strength because she took a long break. Who could have imagined the Rosetta Cuzzle would end up like this? He even says she gets bitten by a dog nowadays, but she had enough of his nagging and covered her ears, turning away from him. Seeing how annoyed his sister is, Lenoa tells her that she should have been like that since the start, and because she lost to Lenoa, Rosetta ended up being escorted back to her chambers. This would have been fine and all, but now she can't help but wonder when and how far this knight assigned to her plans to follow her. Truthfully speaking, she doesn't really mind if there is a knight assigned to her. But if he were to stick to her like glue, she wouldn't be able to speak to Sihel freely. Before she could reach the door to her chambers, she turned to him and told the knight that he could go now, but the latter said that it could not be, to which she told him that if he didn't want to get back to their quarters, he can just stay in the room next to her and that he will call for her when she needs him. He tried to reason against her, but before he could, Rosetta told him that this was an order, making the man stand frozen in place. 
In her mind, she really didn't want to use this method, but she had to, so with her angriest tone she shouted at him and told him to go and leave. The knight trembled in fear, seeing the young lady pissed off, and as he scurried off, she told him in her mind that she should have gone ahead when she first said it. She quietly entered her chambers and was welcomed by the sight of Sihel on her bed. She asked why His Majesty was giving him such a funny look, and the wolf replied that all the rumors about her couldn't be true. He found it hard that she would even be so mindful to care about a knight who couldn't do his duty well, but in her mind, she tells him that's what rumors are all about in the first place. Mostly false. She decided to change the topic, asking His Majesty if he hadn't changed his bandages yet, earning a question from him as to why she bothered to do such troublesome things for him. She answered that because he was so fierce only she could touch him because everybody else was afraid of him. Sihel then asked if they were that afraid to the point that they even feared getting close to him to treat his wounds, which she affirms, also explaining why she is the one who feeds and walks him. Hearing all this, Sihel concluded that he must have given her his permission to touch him sometime earlier, and Rosetta half laughed, thinking that she could beat him any time. She dutifully removed his bandages and was surprised to see that his wounds had already healed, asking him if he had a power like that. But Sihel said he doesn't, which only means that it could be because of her blood that it healed. He also thought so, but Rosetta could only grow more frustrated and surprised at her blood's healing ability, since there was no such thing for her character in the book. If anything, this power should be given to the main lead and not the villain, which made her wonder aloud if this blood could also be useful to humans. He told her that maybe it was not since she couldn't have wounds on her body if they were real. Again, this made her think that maybe this power is only effective for Sahel, making her wonder if it's a good or bad thing to have, though one thing is for sure, she can't help but feel constantly attached to him. She gave a loud sigh as she thought about all this, with Sihel asking if her eyes were hurting. She assured him that she was fine, saying that if it hurt a lot, it would bring shame to Kazel's name. She reached out her hand to pat his head, only to stop midway. The two looked at each other, with Rosetta asking if they shouldn't do things like this anymore. But Sihel only told her that it didn't matter, and asked why she wanted to pet his head. With a smile, she told him that it was because he was pretty, making him turn his head to the side, and shyly ask if she really found him pretty. Because of the assassination attempt, Sihel has become attached to her hip, apart from the fact that he also understood that all of the rumors about her were just bad ones. One day, both Master and Pet went out for a walk with her knight, Alan, presenting to walk with them. Seeing him so eager like this made her think that not too long ago, he walked on eggshells around her, careful not to ruin her mood. But for today, she turned down the knight's offer to walk with her, choosing to go with Shasha instead. He was about to give up until Rosetta pointed to one of the shaded areas among the trees, telling him to wait for them there. He was so pleased that the lady even considered a nice waiting spot for him, beaming as he excitedly went over the said spot. Looking at him like this, she wonders how a guy like him could go and make the grave decision of joining the Kozel Knights. As soon as they were out of earshot, Sihel spoke and asked her if she would consider taming him, since he seemed to listen well to her instructions. She liked the idea and decided that she should, especially since she managed to tame an aggressive one just recently. At this, Sihel asked if he was the one she was referring to, and Rosetta commented that he caught on well, patting his head as she said so. She tells him that her brother Ronald will be coming here today, and as she keeps petting him, she realizes that Sihel hasn't bathed in three weeks. So she asked him if he wanted to go and take a shower first before meeting her brother, seeing how his fur was all matted and dirty. Rosetta took it upon herself to bathe him personally, which made His Majesty comment that there was some truth in the rumor after all, because he didn't expect her to be so aggressive in bathing him. At this, she reasoned out that she was only harsh because she had to scrub hard at his dirty fur, all the while Sihel commented that he looked defeated, saying he had lost his innocence. At his comment, Rosetta only laughed, which made him even more flustered as he told her to stop talking about his marriage. At that, she snickered at him, asking if he actually wanted to find a mate, then promising to find him a good one later on. He got even more annoyed, but Rosetta had fun teasing him like a baby. At that, she poured the last of the water basin over his head to wash him off while Sihel thought about how he doesn't mind anyone staring at him while he's soaking wet. As soon as she was done, she got out first to towel him dry when His Majesty started to shake the water off his fur, splashing it everywhere and onto Rosetta. She got annoyed at him, especially since she warned him before not to do it again, but the cursed prince only huffed, saying that it was his revenge from earlier. 
She started wiping the water off her body while Sihel turned his head up, which she noticed quickly. So she asked if there was something in the ceiling, and he said that there were just a lot of water droplets. Just then, the door to the bathroom opened, just as Rosetta told him that everything else would be dried out once he was out of the bath. Sihel already had his attention turned to the door when Rosetta heard someone call out to her and saw Ronald standing before her. She noted how she thought Lenoa looked similar to her, but it was actually her eldest brother who bore the most resemblance to her. Lenoa followed suit, yawning as he entered the bathroom and asking his sister if she played in the water before blatantly telling her that he could see through her clothes. He ordered him to change her clothes and stop attacking her eyes, earning a smack on the head from their oldest and making Lenoa mad at him when he was only telling the truth. Since Lenoa mentioned it, she now realizes that her undergarments are showing, and she now understands why Sihel looked away and up at the ceiling instead. She asks him if he saw her undergarments, but the wolf has his head turned away from her, denying that he saw anything, which she knew he was lying about. Suddenly, Lenoa froze, saying that he must be still half asleep because he couldn't believe he just heard the wolf talk when Sihel spoke again and told him that he looked just like Rosetta. Her second brother then asked if the voice he was hearing belonged to the crown prince, and Sihel spoke again, casually mentioning how he hadn't changed and asking if he was still living a casual life. Lenoa was dumbfounded before letting out a loud curse, running straight back to her bedchambers and grabbing one of the blankets, which he quickly used to cover Rosetta's body. He angrily turned toward the cursed prince, telling him not to look while he reprimanded Rosetta for showing off. She explained to him that she only got wet because she was giving him a bath earlier, but Lenoa was mad, telling her that all men are wolves. At that, she couldn't help but snap back at him, telling him how he already knew that he was a wolf, yet he still pushed the animal into her care with both siblings bickering non-stop. Ronald had to intervene and pull them apart, telling Rosetta to go get changed and come to his room once she was done, while he told Lenoa to stop talking nonsense and to wash his face before proceeding to his room as well. Before she went ahead, Rosetta asked her eldest brother if he could dry His Majesty's hair before he caught a cold, to which Sihel said he should because he was feeling cold. Ronald agreed, leaving Lenoa incredulous at how his elder brother could do something like that. Before he took off, Lenoa shouted at her sister to wear something black, with Lenoa terrified, remembering how he shot a bullet into the prince's body. Rosetta quickly changed into a new dress, following his brother's instruction to wear a black one, and she came down just in time to see that Ronald had just finished drying Seal. She didn't expect him to actually dry him out fully, but she was pleased that he did so, calling out to the crown prince and asking if her brother treated him well. At that, Sihel told him that Ronald didn't even bother removing his eye gel, which her brother didn't bother commenting on. Instead, he asked everyone to come with him to his room. The four of them sat together, and Rosetta couldn't help but notice how Lenoa had been in a pretty foul mood, glaring at her. He already knew that Shasha was the crown prince, and yet he continued to act with such a bad attitude. Speaking of Lenoa, she asks the wolf on her side if it is all right for Lenoa to know about his identity, and Sihel replies that there's no other way, because all of them will have to stay together for now. Plus, he's not just a random body, he's also a Kazel, which is why the crown prince chose to trust him. Instead of feeling honored, Lenoa told Sihel that he shouldn't trust him, earning another smack in the head from Ronald. The eldest finally spoke up and told them that they should talk about what happened, with Sihel explaining everything that happened until now. Since he was raided by the queen, he drank Rosetta's blood and regained his sanity. Upon hearing that, Ronald's brows furrowed at him for drinking his sister's blood, and Sihel added that he not only gained sanity, but his wounds also healed. A deafening silence fell over them, with Rosetta feeling uncomfortable and telling them in her mind not to stare at her too hard, because even she didn't know about her blood powers. Ronald then asked if she could heal other people's wounds since her blood seemed to work on him, and Rosetta answered that she was also curious about that, which is why she wanted to test if it would work on humans. That being said, she points to both brothers and asks them if one of them would be willing to be her test subjects. Lenoa quickly shot the suggestion down, wondering out loud why she had such good abilities. At that, she asks him angrily if he wants to try and find out, suggesting cutting one of his fingers, but Lenoa still refuses. In the end, Ronald was the one who served as Rosetta's test subject. He pricked his finger and drank her blood from the wine glass to see if its magical abilities would work on his wound as well. Unfortunately, it didn't work, so they concluded that her blood doesn't work on humans. Rosetta, who also had her finger pricked, let Ciel drink the blood off it, which made Lenoa ma. 
He asked why she was letting him do such a thing, which she simply answered by saying that she didn't want to waste it. This rendered both of her brothers speechless, with Ronald shifting the conversation back to important matters, telling them that Nanabi would come soon. The said person's first assignment is to check if it's possible to purify the poison created by the queen, and as if on cue, Nanabi arrives and asks if she can take a sample of Rosetta's blood. She couldn't care what the results would be, since the young lady knew that it wouldn't work on her anyway, while Lenoa explained that the reason why His Highness's curse wasn't purified was because the queen created a special poison for him. This left him asking if the curse could be completely lifted if they managed to remove the poison. Rosetta said no, explaining that once the poison is removed, he'll turn into a human right away, and when the full moon comes, he will revert to being a wolf again. The queen knew that which is why she sent assassins to take him out. At that, Lenoa vowed that if she ever sent assassins again, he'd make sure to torture them if it meant he could wring an answer out of their bodies. Thinking to herself, Rosetta knew that there was only one way to escape the curse passed down from generation to generation, and that was for Ciel to meet his lover, Liliana. Going back to their conversation, Rosetta told them that they needed to remove the poison first, adding that she knew a witch who specialized in purification and suggested that Sihel go to a safer place. Lenoa tells Ronald that someone dared to hurt the crown prince and make him suffer before turning to his sister and telling her beforehand that she should have just cut the throats of those rats. It doesn't matter if she did a good job staying in her seat. Ronald was quiet and only said that he'd have to ask his highness himself, and Rosetta told him that there was no need to ask her because she knew the right thing to do. With that, their eldest stood up and patted Rosetta's head, telling her that she did a job well done, instantly making her blush. She couldn't help her reaction because this was the first time in six years that she had been complimented. As soon as she was left alone with C. Hell, he asked her what had happened for her to have such a reaction. When Rosetta didn't answer, the cursed prince told her that he could do it too, patting her head, which surprised her. But instead of blushing as she did earlier with Ronald, she grew frustrated because nobody just casually touched someone's hair like this, with Sihel asking why she didn't like what he was doing, just when he thought she might like it. She held his head in both hands, reminding him that she did not want to be treated like a dog, then proceeded to hug him, calling him beautiful. At that, Sihel asked if she frequently said the words beautiful and kind, to which she asked him if he just remembered something. Sihel explained that it wasn't the case, but it was more like he got so used to her hugging him that he could now hear her voice unconsciously whenever she did. At that, Rosetta noted that this was getting a little dangerous, getting closer to him like this. Meanwhile, Lenoa and Ronald had a little private conversation between them, with the older telling the younger to confess what he did. Furthermore, Ronald warned that if he found out that Lenoa was lying, he would make him run 30 laps around the practice field. At that, the younger quickly fessed up saying that Rosetta wanted a dog, which is why she took the wolf home, with Ronald glaring at him and asking what else their sister did. He answered by saying she shot the cursed prince, earning a punch in the gut, which made Lenoa backtrack on his statement, saying he didn't really know what else she did. The younger tried to save face, saying that if he hadn't brought back the wolf, he firmly believed that it would have died out there, but Ronald knows his brother too well for him to say cover-up lies like these. In the end, Lenoa admitted to all of it, so their eldest asked what else he knew about Rosetta. The younger said that she has changed now, and that she worked really hard as well, so there's no need for Ronald to comment on it. The elder only asks if he really believes that Rosetta changed for the better, and Lenoa admits that he does, promising that from now on, she won't cause trouble or bother the servants anymore. Plus, Lenoa also stressed that it's because of her that the Magic Stone Project has begun, wherein the Baron will adjust his opinion on it while Rosetta takes care of it. If Ronald still can't believe it, then he should just ask the Baron personally. But then again, their oldest is not aware of how much the Baron likes Rosetta. Just by giving a mere opinion, the man would gladly clap his hands for her, and Ronald could only ask if she really made the right decision. Still, Lenoa noticed that the Baron seemed pretty preoccupied at the moment, trying to get Asila's contract and being happy at being able to do so. Even he found the change in his sister pretty interesting, opting to stop working and choosing to stay at home just so he could come face to face with her more frequently. Before he turned to walk away, Lenoa told their eldest that there was no need for him to be concerned about her and just let her be, especially since it's been a long time since all three of them came together like this. And since Ronald had no more questions to ask, Lenoa decided to leave first, nursing his gut from where Ronald punched him earlier. The oldest stood quietly, 
thinking about how something had changed while he was not at home, which made him decide that he should pay more attention from now on. The next day, Rosetta was busy brushing Seahel's hair, with Ronald staring at her quietly from the couch. Finally, she couldn't take it and asked her brother if he had something he wanted to say, but the older man said he didn't, telling her to just carry on with her tasks. In her mind, she finds it uncomfortable how he seems to watch her every move, but she casts it aside now that she's finished brushing Sihel's hair. As soon as she was done, he stood up with her, asking if he wanted to sleep on the bed. He answered in the form of another question, asking when she plans to wake him up, and Rosetta answered that she would do so in an hour and they could go for a walk later. The crown prince grunted in agreement and without another word, plopped himself on her bed, which made her wonder if the bed was still hers or if maybe it now belonged to Sihel. In the beginning, he only napped on it because he was wary, but he managed to get a good sleep on it knowing that she was there to protect him. Originally, it made her wonder if their relationship could only go from bad to worse, but now she can't believe how their relationship has progressed to such a trustworthy extent. As soon as Sihel fell asleep, Ronald called her over, telling her to sit with him as he asked if something wrong had happened these days. Rosetta answered that nothing much really happened, and she had been spending most of her days raising the crown prince, although, in her mind, she wondered if something had happened that she was not aware of. Ronald hummed in agreement, saying it must be so, making her question why he said something like that. At her question, her older brother smiled softly and said that it was because he had been hearing nothing but good things about her recently. Seeing him like this sent a shiver down her spine. She told him that he wouldn't have to worry anymore because from now on, she would start to live well. And Ronald agreed, saying that Lenoa had said the same thing about her. Just then, one of the maids arrived, carrying with her a cup of tea for the young lady, and it was pretty obvious that the maid feared her mistress. The trembling in her hand was proof of that. However, Rosetta doesn't seem to get why the other was shaking so much that in the end, the cup of tea fell to the floor, leaving the maid apologizing profusely for her mistake. In her mind, Rosetta just wanted her gone since her incessant staring wouldn't solve any problems, so she told her to get out, which the maid hurriedly did. Seeing the whole fiasco unfold before his eyes, Ronald commented that his sister had really changed, as he said that he never expected her to grow up so much during the time he couldn't see her. He also told her that both their parents will be happy to see this development, which he too is happy and proud of. At that, she asks him if he has taken his medication for today, but Ronald stands up, telling her that she still speaks what's on her mind without any filter. He approaches her and gives his sister a couple of head pats, making her pout and Ronald smile, seeing how her old habit hasn't changed one bit. Later that night, the results of Rosetta's blood analysis came in, and according to Nanabi, if the demon absorbs her blood, it will have more strength and it will also make its brain work faster. She further explained that the young lady's blood concentration is so high that even inhaling a little could heal wounds, apart from the fact that it also smells sweet to them. So once they catch a whiff of it, it's most likely that they'll run after her and get drunk on it. In simpler terms, her blood is both a tonic and a necessity for demons. This made Lenoa understand why the demons came after her when they saw her, while Ronald commented that she must have suffered a lot when she was much younger. Speaking of running, Rosetta remembered that His Majesty also ran to her, and he said that it was because she smelled sweet. Nanabi added that because His Majesty has demon blood flowing through him, it's only natural for him to be affected as well. After all, Sihel's ancestors were the first demons to set foot in human territory, where they married the humans they loved and bore children soon after. Back then, a child was born as a hybrid between a human and a demon who possessed extraordinary strength and intelligence. That child knew just how great he was and decided that the only suitable position for him was the throne, which he was able to monopolize in due time. This hybrid was the first emperor of the Idris family, but during the battle for the throne, he accidentally killed the spirit warrior that the imperial family was protecting. And this, the curse of a soul filled with resentment, was cast upon the emperor. On the night of the full moon, he was cursed to become a wolf and kill his loved ones. At first, the emperor thought that passing the fortnight would be enough, but the curse didn't stop there. He returned to his human form every 15 days at first. But in time, he didn't know when the time of living as a human and wolf lengthened, and in the end, he succumbed to becoming a full wolf and died at the hands of his own children. From there, the real problem started in their family because, as time went by, the bloodline faded and the cursed child was not born. And right when Seal was born, the fading curse happened again, leaving the young Siahel struggling every time he turned into a wolf for 15 days. 
Thinking about it now, Rosetta realizes that he might end up just like the first emperor if the curse can't be broken, and there's a high chance that he will completely turn into a wolf. According to what His Majesty said, it happened due to a thunderclap in the arid sky, which is also the time he saw Rosetta and very much wanted to grab and devour her. Nanabi said that there was a high chance it could happen, but Sihel could only frown. As if to prove a point, she told him how he used to view her as a yummy piece of meat not too long ago, and noticed how there are still some times when he views her with such a hungry expression, though it's much less than before. Ronald finally spoke up, saying that if His Majesty really wanted to revert to his human form, then he needed the help of a witch to do so. He then turns to Nanabi, asking if there was any progress on their hunt for the said witch, but the latter answered that they still haven't found one yet since it will take quite some time. The oldest Kazal urged them to do better since there wasn't much time left, and everyone could only answer him in silence. At that, Rosetta just told them to calm down, knowing in her mind that one such witch would be appearing soon, one week at the latest when Liliana would finally appear in the story. The following day, Ronald went back to the Imperial capital, but before he left, he told His Majesty that he would be seeing him again at Rosetta's coming-of-age ceremony. But unlike the blunt and cold first day, this was a soft response. As for Lenoa, he got busy with the wine chest when one of the supervisors disappeared, while Nanabi also set out and stopped at the dukedom. With each passing day, Sahel gets more docile, which in turn results in the servants getting used to his presence, and even if the surroundings have changed a little bit, it is still a peaceful life they are living. Rosetta wished nothing but for days like this to continue. It was all but wishful thinking, because it didn't take long for Sihel to start acting up. This time, he kept on biting Rosetta's hand, much to her annoyance, as she warned him not to chew on her hand like this, even if he was hungry. Looking at him, she was the one who decided to cut down on his portions, because she was worried about his health but she wasn't aware that he'd keep chewing her hand like that. She tried to give him an alternative, handing him a big bone to chew on, but Sahel completely ignored the item. What's even worse is that he started clawing at the tapestry and thrashing the whole chamber so much that Rosetta told him in a firm voice to stop, threatening him with her aura as she told him so. She punches him in the head and calls him a bad wolf, claiming that she'll make him regret his bad behavior soon enough. It instantly triggers an already furious Sihael, and he reprimands her for trying to threaten the crown prince. Rosetta, in turn, tells him to behave like one if he claims to be the crown prince and wants her to respect him. The wolf tries to argue that if she at least treated him like a human, he would try to act like the crown prince too, however. In the middle of his sentence, he loses control of his tongue and begins to woof and bark at her instead. Rosetta realizes that the effect of her blood has run out, and as she stands before him in all her unbothered glory, the Duchess tells him he won't be receiving another drop of her blood for the next 24 hours as a punishment for his recent untamed behavior. Sihael obviously doesn't like the proposition and sneers at her with bloodthirsty eyes before charging at her with all his might. His efforts are all in vain, though since Rosetta has had enough of his tantrums and immediately catches him in his tracks, hoists him up on her shoulder, and decides to throw him on her bed. Unluckily, however, she loses control of her arms and accidentally ends up throwing him across a wall instead. She tries to apologize almost immediately, but as soon as the wolf regains his composure, he grows even more upset, even angrier, and even more murderous. That said, he begins to chase her around the house with the sole motive of teaching her a lesson and sends her into a state of frenzy as she tries to outrun him. Soon enough, an exhausted Rosetta finds herself sprawled across the lawn with her big, bad wolf pinning her to the ground, trying to use his claws to bore some blood out of her. As she tries to keep him at bay, Rosetta imagines how romantic this moment could have been with her lying all helpless beneath the male lead of the story, had she been the female lead. But right now, all it is to her is a relentless fight for her life. After a moment of struggling to keep him off of herself, Rosetta eventually shoves him away and once again blesses him with the appellation of a bad wolf, making poor Sihael falter before her. However, despite his obviously sad demeanor, the Duchess tells him he won't be getting any blood from her until he learns to behave himself. Expectedly, over the course of the next few hours, he remains unconvinced and proceeds to bark up a storm until the following morning. Rosetta, who has successfully stayed firm on her decision for the past whole day, brings him to the lawn once again and tells him she'll allow him to have her blood if he continues to behave himself. That said, she throws him a ball to fetch, and he angrily runs after it. Strangely, however, minutes pass and Rosetta awaits his return. 
wondering why he hasn't returned yet and if something wrong has occurred. Just as she worries about him, Sihael shows up with a strange thing held between his teeth, making Rosetta worry even further, since it certainly isn't the ball she threw him earlier. Soon enough, the object is revealed to be a trembling, terrified rabbit who whimpers under Rosetta's gaze. She asks Sihael if it is his peace offering, to which he nods and woofs, making her blush as she happily wonders who taught him such sweet gestures. Touched by his thoughtfulness, she allows him to take a sip of her blood and offers him her hand, which he gladly gnaws at. As the wolf regains his ability to speak, he quickly begs for forgiveness and asks the Duchess never to put him through it again. Just as he promises never to be naughty in his behavior ever again, Rosetta apologizes for her rudeness too and asks him to release the rabbit back into the forest so they can return to the mansion. He sulks about working too hard on catching it just to release it back in the woods, and Rosetta chuckles, wondering how he even came up with such a clever idea. As he mumbles that he doesn't know, Rosetta strokes his head and giggles at how much his future sweetheart would love it, earning a groan from the wolf. Later on, Rosetta decides to allow him to eat whatever he wants on the condition that he will work out just as much. However, her proposition goes terribly wrong when the gluttonous wolf begins to wake her up in the middle of the night, demanding for his fair share of food. Despite her annoyance, Rosetta takes him on a stroll to the kitchen in the middle of the night, making him promise to run twice as many laps in the morning and worries that, at this rate, the beast might grow twice as huge. Just as she tells him he's gaining too much weight, a loud clatter reaches their ears, and Rosetta locates that the sound has come from the kitchen. Alarmed, the two of them quickly peek into the kitchen through the narrow seam between the door panels, worried about what they'll do if it turns out to be a thief, only to discover that the thief is none other than one of their own mansion maids. Upon being discovered by the mistress, the maid quickly gets down on her knees and begins to beg for forgiveness, explaining that it is because she's been supplying her share of supper to her sick brother every day and using all her earnings to support his health that she had to steal to quiet her grumbling stomach. Rosetta recognizes the sniffing maid as the one who spilled tea on her a few days ago and wonders if she should be impressed with her audacity or be dismayed at the disrespect. However, she quickly decides to discard both options as she finds her heart aching at the sight of a malnourished little girl prostrating herself before her while her own dog is so well-fed that he's beginning to double up in size. When Rosetta asks for her name, the maid tells her it is Hannah, leading her to question if she starves herself a lot. Although she denies it, Judging by how she's drooling at the mere aroma of reheated food, Rosetta deduces otherwise. Once the food has been reheated, she offers a bowl full of curry to both Sihael and Hana. However, the latter begs her not to eat her alive. Annoyed, the Duchess exclaims that she is no cannibal, only for the maid to clarify that she meant that she does not want to be fed to the wolf since she has heard about how everyone who wrongs her is fed to him. The rumor completely baffles Rosetta and makes her realize that the reason why her servants have been feeding Sihael secretly is because they assume he feeds on humans and they do not want to get eaten themselves. Nonchalantly, Rosetta in turn questions Hana, since her dear wolf eats only premium meat, if she thinks she'd fit his taste. The teary maid gladly says that she won't, leading Rosetta to shrug her off and tell her to get down to eating immediately. Soon enough, the maid gets down to chomp on her meal, and while she does so, Rosetta asks her about her brother's health. She explains that the doctors don't understand what's wrong with him and believe that it is incurable. When asked about any other living family member, Hana says that it is only her brother and herself since their parents have passed away. It saddens Rosetta and reminds her of her past self from her previous life, making her wonder why, of all the things she could have in common with the maid, it is the tragedies of her past life. Sighing, the Duchess tells the maid to clean up before leaving, and returns to her room with Sihael. As she lies in her bed, unable to sleep, and in a state of melancholy, Sihael wonders if it is her maid's circumstances that worry her. Rosetta says it is true that she is a little worried about her, making the wolf caress her hand and tell her she is very kind. It baffles her, being the villainess of the story, and she mumbles that she doesn't feel the same way. Sihael in turn tells her it is because she doesn't think she is kind that makes her immensely selfless, it makes her wonder why he thinks so when she did nothing to help out Hana in particular. In fact, her way of talking to her was rather stern. As she turns to her side in the bed, her heart squeezes at the thought that the maiden's eyes and hair, and even her home situation, somehow remind her of her past self. However, she instantly shrugs it off, telling herself that she is worried for naught. 
as she lies in her bed, wearing a frown. In the morning, as Marina helps the Duchess get dressed for the day, Rosetta asks if she knows about a maid named Hannah and if she is aware of her home situation. Marina says that she does and informs her that she's been here for over a year. She also reveals that since their butler rather dotes on her, he sent their doctor to look into her brother's condition, however, to no avail. That's when Rosetta realizes that her brother's condition may not have been caused by a medical illness, since even a skilled doctor hasn't been able to diagnose him and may have been a magical curse. Just as she's lost in her deduction, Marina asks if she is worried about Hana. Rosetta doesn't deny it, and reasons that it is because she is so malnourished that it is hard to miss her before wondering how old she is. Marina reveals that she is 17, shocking the Duchess as she compares herself to her frail maid, baffled at how she assumed she'd be no more than 15 given her physique. As she massages her forehead out of worry, Rosetta reminds herself that it isn't hers to deal with and that she cannot look after each person working under her roof. Contrary to this, however, only moments later, Rosetta asks Nanabi to see Hana's brother and explains that his illness hasn't been cursed by medicine in over a year. Nanabi tells her she'll gladly do it as they decide to pay Hana's brother a visit in the evening. Sihael, who stands right next to her with a peculiar look on his face while Nanabi leaves, says that he'll come with her too. Rosetta wonders why that is, making him explain that since it is her job to protect him, he needs to stay by her side just in case some danger strikes him and he can't protect his poor, frail self. Rosetta only rolls her eyes at his obviously blatant lie and reminds him that his poor, frail self has yet to run the laps that he promised her. Hearing this, Sihel immediately turns his back on her and begins to walk away, excusing himself since he's too tired, only for the Duchess to hoist him over her shoulder and remind him, almost menacingly, that he needs to keep his promises. Later in the day, Hana shows up in Rosetta's room at her request. The latter explains that since she informed her about her brother's ill health, she has decided to have a magician take a look at him. Introducing Nanabi, she explains that she is a very powerful mage who is willing to help them, and once the women have introduced themselves, they leave for Hana's house immediately, along with Sihel. When they reach Hana's shabby residence, Rosetta feels like the air is a bit familiar to her, which makes complete sense once she gets to see Hana's brother, lying all famished in his bed, and recognizes his identity. It's Eugene Mills, the boy who comes under Liliana's tutelage, and is the sole reason why she even visits North in the first place. As Rosetta stares at him in horror, she realizes that the house feels familiar because it's where Liliana makes her first appearance in the story. Rosetta recalls from the original plot that after Liliana was ordered by a sorcerer to locate and treat Eugene, she met him on the verge of death and used her magic to save him. However, as things stand currently, she realizes that Eugene's condition is too bad for them to wait for Liliana's arrival. Right then, Nanabi completes examining the frail boy and turns to Rosetta, whispering that she has successfully diagnosed his illness. It is something called magus hyperemia that is caused by a blockage of magic in his veins and happens when magic ceases to flow through someone's vessels, causing them to vomit out blood. She further explains that most magicians, when they first discover their powers, suffer from this condition and that it can be fatal in most cases. However, despite being such a dangerous condition, it is easily curable. She also goes on to wonder how he held on for a whole year when most succumb to this disease within mere months. However, her speech is halted when she notices the look of horror on the mistress's face as she worries about what would become of Sihael if Liliana never arrives. She debates that if they leave Eugene just the way he is right now, he will live either way, since that's what his destiny is. But if Sihael needs to regain his human, he invariably needs Liliana's assistance. She is recused from this overthinking when Hana's voice startles her as the maid weeps almost too miserably for her to bear, wondering if her brother cannot be saved any longer and if they are too late already. Her words leave her speechless, almost as if her resolve has shattered, and she turns to Sihail, noticing how he has been watching her since the beginning, and how he trusts her, cares for her, and depends solely on her. She takes a deep breath in and kneels before him, caressing his face and promising that no matter what happens now, she will break his curse no matter what. As he watches her closely, she places a gentle kiss on his forehead, leading him to nod and say that he trusts her, since he has no way of suspecting her when she talks to him so sincerely. Still skeptical about her choice, and well aware of how much regret awaits her if Sihail cannot be saved later on, thanks to her foolish decision today, Rosetta turns to Nanabi and asks her to treat Eugene, earning Hana's sincerest gratitude. Night falls, and Rosetta lies in her bed, wide awake, as she wonders how things turned out to be this way. 
She worries that despite her instructing Hana to keep her brother's recovery a secret and to spread rumors about his ill health far and wide, they may never meet Liliana ever again. That said, she wonders if it is finally time for her to hire someone to locate the mage herself. Sihel, who is sitting right beside her, wonders how powerful Eugene must be to suffer from a condition only the most powerful mages suffer from, only to learn that he was needed for them to reach Liliana. As Rosetta apologizes for messing everything up, Sihael wonders if this is the reason why she suddenly promised him that she'll break his curse no matter what. Recalling all the pitiful events from the day, Rosetta kicks her legs beneath the bedsheet in frustration, startling the wolf who goes on to wonder if she knew about Eugene's identity when she went to see him. She denies knowing it, and regrets that she had no other choice besides saving him. Sihael, as he lies down right next to her, reassures her that she made the right choice, and that since she has already promised to break his curse either way, she will do so. When he confesses that her promise has touched him, Rosetta is moved to tears and swears to go to hell, if that's what she needs to do in order to find the magician. Sihael tells her not to go that far, but she insists on breaking through the gates of hell and raging chaos, a proposition that makes him chuckle as they lie down in the bed, all cuddled up. Later in the night, once Rosetta falls asleep, Sihael sneaks out of her room in a state of confusion, wondering why she values him so much and is willing to go so far for him. He assumes it is because she sees him as her pet still, which is also why she always refers to him as Shasha and cuddles and kisses him so carelessly. As the memory of her kiss from the evening flashes in his mind, a profuse blush pops up on his face and he shakes his head, wondering why he feels so embarrassed about being kissed by a woman three years younger than him. However, he can't deny that he likes being around her since her hands are gentle, her face is sweet and her words are genuine and kind. Moreover, she has given him enough kindness within this one month that no one has shown to him in his entire lifetime. Realizing this, he tells himself that it cannot go beyond this point because if it develops even further, he will inevitably reach the point of no return. Suddenly, Hana calls out to him, and as he turns around, he finds her running towards him with her breath hitching, which he finds strange, and compares her to Rosetta who could climb twice the distance with him on her shoulders without even breaking a sweat. As Hana approaches him, she wonders if Rosetta is still asleep, which he doesn't respond to, knowing full well that he needs to keep the fact that he can speak, a secret. The maid, on the other hand, continues to chatter with him, wondering whether he is going out for a solo walk and if his favorite dish is meat. As she goes on to guess whether he likes fruits, meats, or fish for food, she teases him by saying that she is sure about one thing that he most definitely likes. At that is Rosetta. The allegation irks Seahale, and he outright blurts that Rosetta isn't some food to be compared to meats and cheeses, only to realize it a bit too late that he has in fact spoken in front of a stranger. Surprisingly, however, Hana stays unstartled at the strange revelation and goes on to explain that she meant that he likes Rosetta as a person, not food. Sihel, on the other hand, accuses her of being aware of the fact that he could speak, which she doesn't deny. She reveals that the other night, she overheard the two of them talking and thought that he was worried about her well-being, since he kept asking her if she was okay, which is why she now knows about his secret. Sihel wonders if she knows who he is, only for Hana to say that he is a mythical wolf god, an assumption that puts his worries to bed. Although he is still a bit embarrassed about being overheard, especially when he was feeling vulnerable before Rosetta, when Hana asks him whether he knows what his mistress likes, he shamelessly tells her it is him. Regret comes rushing into his senses instantly, but he tries to convince himself that he isn't wrong, since Rosetta genuinely likes him and cherishes him above all the other things and people, and the fact that Hana doesn't find it too cheesy does indeed help. Although she agrees with him, she still goes on to wonder what her favorite food is since she plans on preparing it for her to express her gratitude. After a moment of thinking, Sihel exclaims that she is particularly fond of apple pies and recalls how happy she looked when she had it a few days ago, going as far as to compare her stuffed, smiling face to that of a squirrel or rabbit. He instantly reprimands himself for thinking that she is cute and worries that he may have gotten himself into something a lot more complicated than he thinks. Just then, Hana thanks him for his support and bids him a quick farewell before dashing off somewhere. Sihel, who is the only one left behind now, deduces that such a stupid little girl could never be the Empress's spy and decides to return to the manor, worried that Rosetta might already be up. The sun has barely come up when he makes it into the manor, but he is still met with the sounds of clattering doors and clamoring servants, almost as if the whole mansion is in utter chaos. Instantly alarmed, Sihel worries about Rosetta and wonders if they've been attacked by another group of assassins 
as he rushes through the hallways and begins to climb up the stairs to her bedroom. On his way, however, a servant shows up in a state of panic and quickly announces that he has found Shasha as soon as he lays his eyes on the wolf. Just as Sihael observes the scene in bewilderment, loud footsteps approach him, which bear a strange semblance to those of Rosetta, and he soon finds her dashing towards him, dressed in her thin, white nightgown. His mouth gapes at the embarrassing sight of her disheveled clothing, as he finds himself wondering why a lady would run around her house dressed in something like that. His questions, however, stay unanswered, as he is immediately hoisted up in mid-air by Rosetta's miraculously strong arms, and he is taken back to her room while all the servants observe their peculiarly quiet mistress. As soon as the walls of her room shelter his secret, angrily asks why she is running around in her house without a robe, knowing full well that many men can see her like that. Rosetta, in turn, yells at him for disappearing without a word and begins to crumble before him as she mumbles how scary it was for her to find her bed empty in the morning. Sihael quietly listens to her as she goes on to complain about how she had to look into each and every room in her house to locate him, and yet she still couldn't find him, and he finds his resolve shattering right before his eyes. He wonders why she always shows up before him and confuses him with her unconditional love and affection, especially when he chooses to put some distance between the two of them. He is rescued from his thoughts as Rosetta wonders, with her arms crossed in anger, if he has something that he'd like to say in retaliation. Sihael, on the other hand, only embarrasses himself further by taking a closer look at her while she is dressed in the nightgown that clings to her skin almost too perfectly. He instantly reprimands himself and shakes his head, reminding himself that she is his friend's sister and a young girl who isn't even out in society yet. Just as he is shaking his head, Rosetta smiles and deduces that he must have wanted to go on a morning walk after realizing that he needs to take care of his physique. Sahil argues that he is perfectly healthy, only for the Duchess to pinch his belly and make him realize that he is about to become twice his size from all the eating and resting he has been doing. Her childish mischief annoys Sihael, and he stomps back up on her bed, telling himself that this is the real Rosetta who only likes to tease him and doesn't even see him as a human being. The lady wonders if she offended him in some way and goes on to tell him that he's still pretty, no matter what. The sulking wolf claims that he was a lot more handsome when he was human, making Rosetta caress his head and say that she believes him. Since he is already so pretty as a wolf, he must have been gorgeous as a human. Irked at her carelessness, he clarifies that he meant handsome and not gorgeous, making her chuckle and state that he must be right. It only drives him even more crazy as he realizes once again that she is still only treating him like a sulking puppy and makes him ask her the question that's been bothering him all night long. Turning to the Duchess, he asks if she would still call him gorgeous and handsome if he turned back to his human form. Without even taking a moment to ponder, Rosetta says that she will, reassuring that him being human or wolf won't change anything between them. It makes Sihael smile and state that he is glad to know that while he hopes for a day to come when he no longer has to call her his master and they can grow closer than they are right now. A few days later, Rosetta sits in the living room with her head in her hands, cursing herself for whatever wrong is happening in her life. As she wonders how one person can hide herself so well, it is revealed that even after trying so hard to look for her, they haven't located even the tiniest hint about where Liliana might be. Just as she regrets changing the storyline in the first place, Sihel notices her sorrow and crawls up to her, placing his head on her lap, as if to console her in his very own way. Just as she squeals at how cute he is, he wonders if things aren't going as planned. Rosetta admits that she knew it would be hard, but regrets that it is proving to be impossible right now. Still, she promises him that she'll bring Liliana to him at all costs, making him nod his head and reassure her that she will successfully do so since she is good at catching things. Skeptically, she wonders what else has she caught, making the wolf smile and say that she caught him. Renoa, who is sitting right across from them, wretches at the sound of it, while Rosetta wonders, dumbfoundedly, if the stoic prince just mumbled something that cheesy. Sihel, on the other hand, claims that he is dead serious about what he just said since she has completely entrapped him. Rosetta, however, wonders why he's suddenly acting so gross when the person that she is trying to catch for him is Liliana. The wolf, on the other hand, wonders if she has already lost interest in what she caught before she thought about Liliana, and tells her that she needs to take care of him and cherish him since she has already caught him. Rosetta, on the other hand, argues that he is meant to be cherished by somebody else who is not her, making him wonder who that could be. Just as they continue their bickering, 
Renoa loses his patience and questions why they are arguing in his room of all places, telling them to take their lover's quarrel outside. Rosetta finds it unbelievable how he can see them as lovers, making Renoa bicker back at her, saying that she's the unbelievable one. Just as he is about to say something else, Sihail crawls up to him and whispers something in his ear. Although the redhead instantly refuses to do as he's being told to, his resolve crumbles when the wolf offers to let him into the imperial wine cellars for a whole day. Without batting an eyelash, he quickly rises from his seat and turns to Rosetta, wondering what her ideal type is. The Duchess doesn't take a moment to think and answers that he needs to be someone who is good-looking, who treats her well, and gives her all of his attention. He doesn't need to be wealthy since she has plenty of it herself, and she doesn't mind if he's a little obsessed with her. On top of it all, a cute side to him is a must, and he must be a completely attentive lover. As both the men stare at her in bewilderment, Rosetta reminds herself that since she is the daughter of a wealthy duke, she is allowed to demand this much at least. After a moment of pin-drop silence, Sihel wonders what she would do if he were wealthier than her. Hearing this, she stands up from her seat with both her hands resting on her waist and declares that that would be enough to make her run down the aisle any moment he wants. Hearing this, Renoa says that he won't let any of that happen since he'll crash her wedding with a pair of guns in his hands. That said, he turns to Sihail with an annoyed expression on his face and tells him to not even think about getting married. The prince, however, only shoves him aside and walks up to the mistress, who wonders what's his take on the question, now that he has heard about her preferences. As pictures of Rosetta begin flashing in his mind, Sihel explains that he wants somebody who is strong and tough, enough to take care of themselves when he isn't there. The Duchess compares this image to that of Liliana and feels like it isn't as fitting as she would like it to be, making her wonder what kind of looks and personality he is looking for. Sihael blatantly answers that he needs someone with a kind heart who has flaming red hair and aqua green eyes. Although Renoa instantly gets what the prince means, Rosetta wonders if he has feelings for her brother Reynold, since he is both tough and strong and has those flaming red hair and aqua eyes that he likes. As the prince stares at her in wild bewilderment, she goes on to state that although he isn't the kindest person out there, the rest of the image fits him perfectly, making Sihael grit his fangs at her and state that he has never wanted to kill her more than he does right now. As Renoa begins to laugh out loud, stating that it is going to be impossible for Sihael, Rosetta wonders why he is laughing so hard, still unaware of the situation's reality. Later, their tea time finishes with Sihael biting the Duke's leg for laughing too much, before retreating into his room, expressing his upset and annoyance at Rosetta. Later in the day, as Rosetta sits in Nanabi's office, the magician worries that the problem is Liliana herself, who hasn't left any traces behind, making it impossible for them to find her. Right then, Eugene knocks at the door of the mage's office and walks in with a cup of tea, making her smile at how much healthier he looks now that he has made such a speedy recovery. She also recalls that after he completely healed, Eugene approached her and kneeled before her, promising to work hard in her service in hopes of repaying her kindness for as long as possible. Just as she smiles at how he looks, almost as if he would give up his life for her sake at any given moment, her eyes accidentally fall on the peculiar bracelet with a lily on a string around his wrist. She immediately grabs his forearm and questions where he got it from, only to learn that a woman in the village gave it to him, saying that it'll bring him good health. This revelation gives her the final clue that she needs to locate Liliana, since these bracelets are something that Liliana made in the novel. Rosetta is sure that the long-awaited mage is finally in town. Now, with Nanabi around, Rosetta asks Eugene about when he received this bracelet from the stranger, to which he reveals that it happened two days ago. With a newfound ray of hope shining right before her, the Duchess asks Eugene if she can keep the bracelet in her possession for some time, which he readily allows, happy to be able to help his savior. As she feels happy about finally being able to trace Liliana's whereabouts, she asks Nanabi if she can pull it off using a magic spell, now that they have something that belonged to her. The mage nods her head confidently, and Rosetta decides to break this news to Sihail right away. She quickly sprints up to his room, hoping to inform him about their great discovery, only to find the room empty with the wolf nowhere in sight. Gritting her teeth in annoyance at how he keeps on running away from the mansion, she walks up to the lawn, calling him by his name and searching for him relentlessly. Just as she does so, her bodyguard Alan walks up to her and greets her respectfully. Noticing the change in his demeanor, she praises how relaxed he feels around her now, contrary to how stiff and alarmed he has always been before. So much so that a mere scolding from her 
would push him on the edge of his seat. As the man awkwardly giggles before his mistress, she asks him if there's any chance that he has seen her wolf around the mansion. Surprisingly, he reveals that he indeed saw him a moment ago with a maid by the rear gate. It makes her wonder when he got so friendly with the maids, but believes him instantly upon imagining how he could have easily been bribed with a piece of steak. On the other hand, at the rear gate, Sihael converses with Hana and wonders what he should do when Rosetta keeps on treating him like a mere pet. Hana, who giggles like a little child, mumbles that she would want nothing more than to become her mistress's pet, which leads him to roll his eyes and regret ever asking her about it in the first place. Right then, Rosetta arrives on the scene and overhears their conversation, wondering what they might be talking about. She then approaches them and questions Sihael with an intimidating look on her face. How come Hana knows about the fact that he can talk to the point that she is freely conversing with him? She asks if she has known about it all along or if he accidentally got caught. Meanwhile, the maid promises not to tell anyone about it ever. Sihael, on the other hand, responds by telling her to let it be since she's a mere simpleton and knows nothing. Hana nods her head at it too, while Rosetta notices the stiffness in the prince's behavior, which leads her to wonder whether he is still cross with her. Putting this matter aside, she turns to Hana and praises her for the apple pie she baked her some time ago, making the maid dance joyously before leaving the two of them to their privacy. With her gone, Rosetta asks Sihael about what they talked about, to which the wolf turns his head away, answering that it is a secret. Just as she wonders why they are keeping secrets from one another all of a sudden, she suddenly remembers why she even came looking for Sihael in the first place and reveals that they can finally locate Liliana's whereabouts. The wolf seems rather uninterested in the topic and instead turns to the Duchess, telling her that he likes women. Rosetta initially doesn't understand but eventually realizes what he means, which leads her to embrace him once again and say that she was merely teasing him about it. She asks if this is the reason why he suddenly left Renoa's room, making him mumble that he expected her to follow after him. When she tells him that she couldn't follow him since she had to talk to Nanabi about Liliana's case, he just sulks and tells her she should have consoled him first, and afterward, they could have visited the sorceress together. The Duchess giggles at his frowning face and chuckles about how childish he can be sometimes. It only annoys the poor prince further, making him jump up on his forelegs and take a bite at Rosetta's lips, calling it her punishment for speaking nonsense. As her blood begins to ooze from the newly elicited wound, Sahil wonders if he can lick it off. She bends down for him to do so, wondering if this could be considered a kiss, a question that annoys her, since she would rather kiss a dashing male lead than a prince stuck in a beast's body. Once he is done, the prince wonders if she thinks her blood would still taste good to him if and when he regains his human form. Rosetta says that she cannot know this and that. He'll have to suck it and see for himself. Laughing, he tells her not to get mad when he does so, as the two of them proceed to take a walk in the forest. As they wander up to the forest after Rosetta dresses up in a more comfortable pair of pants, she tells him that, for today, they will just climb on top of it and get back to see who wins. He suggests that the winner receives a prize just to motivate them to do their best, making her wonder what could that be. He says that the loser grants a wish from the winner, and although the lady feels a bit skeptical about what her dear wolf might demand, she agrees with his terms, telling him that the demand shouldn't be too strange. Just as the wolf nods his head, the duchess positions herself on the starting line and begins the countdown. Startling the prince, she sprints off before the countdown completes, and as she tries to outrun him with all her might, she states that she needs to cheat because that's the only way for her to win against a mystical wolf. True to her expectations, however, the wolf easily outruns her by a large margin the very next moment, saying that they'll meet on the mountaintop now. Rosetta tries to ask him to slow down for her sake and act like a gentleman, only for him to continue to sprint away, reasoning that he is a mere wolf currently. As the prince runs far ahead in the race and Rosetta tries her hardest to catch up to him, some rustling leaves behind her catch her attention, sending her into a state of panic when they displace to reveal a bloodthirsty hybrid beast somewhere in between a pard and a bird. As the chimera squeaks to send a flock of birds into disarray, Rosetta finds herself wondering why it appeared over here of all places and if it's here for her blood. Still, with no time to spare, she unsheathes her sword and charges at the beast instead, slashing and cutting through its existence. As tar-black blood oozes out of its wounds, Rosetta beheads it with the blade of her razor-sharp sword, only to find that it is still standing and willing to charge at her, 
even without its head. Gritting her teeth, she decides that she needs to cut it to shreds before it grows another head, and with this newfound tactic, she charges at him with maximum speed, declaring that only one of them will survive today. After a few good minutes, as the beast lies lifeless on the forest floor, and Rosetta pants as she holds her tar-covered sword in her grip, Sihail rushes back from the mountaintop, worried about her. She flinches at his sudden arrival and tells him to warn her the next time he decides to sprint up to her from behind. The wolf's attention, however, is rather fixated on the dead beast, as he praises her for taking care of it herself, wondering how hard it must have been for her to find the chimera's core, since it is no easy task. Surprisingly, however, Rosetta seems rather clueless about the existence of a core, making him wonder how she even killed it when she wasn't aware of its existence. She innocently answers that she just kept cutting it until it died, a revelation that makes him chuckle out loud as he calls her a woman of her own kind. Unimpressed with his rather plain praises, Rosetta asks how the chimeras even appeared in her forest. He explains that they either could have come down from the northern mountains or could have been sent by none other than the cunning empress. The Duchess recalls from the original story that the Empress often used animals to carry out her magic tricks and had a particular affinity for birds, specifically crows, since her magic wasn't strong enough to summon large animals. However, to overcome this problem, she started experimenting with chimeras to carry out her dirty jobs. Using this information, she deduces that the chimeras were, in fact, sent by none other than her. With this, the two of them decide to return home and inform Renoa about it. Unfortunately, however, on their way, they encounter an even greater number of these beasts. As an exhausted Rosetta complains about their incoming attacks and unexpected appearances, ranting about how much harder it is for her to kill them since she doesn't know how to locate their cores yet, Seahail frowns at her dramatically, wondering why she's blaming him for the attacks. The unbothered Duchess tells him not to abuse his cute face, but he continues to address her with multiple embarrassing endearments and wonders if she would fight off the scary monster for his sake after all. His impersonation of her beloved Shasha only pisses her off even further, and she tells him not to play pretend with her when all she sees is a sly piece of work, not her beloved pet. Just as Sihail protests against this, he accidentally steps into a puddle of tar-black blood, making both of them fall silent. Once they return to the mansion, they inform Renoa about the beasts, and he immediately gathers an army and sends it to finish them off. With him gone, along with Nanabi to offer assistance, only Rosetta and Sihel remain in the mansion, frustrated that they are the ones who get to rest while the others risk their lives for their protection. Either way, since they are all alone, the two of them decide to indulge in pastime activities. For instance, sketching. As Rosetta worries about her brother and his army, she scribbles a sketch of Sihael, upon seeing which he refuses to believe that such a mess could be him. Just as they begin to bicker back and forth, Eugene knocks at the door and steps in, giving her news that they have finally located Liliana's whereabouts. According to this information, the sorceress is still in the north, despite not being in town anymore, and Nanabi shall be heading toward her location to fetch her, first thing in the morning. As he bids them good night and leaves, Rosetta turns to Sihail and holds his face in her gentle grip, happily stating that by this time tomorrow, he will turn back to his human form. Although her words are supposed to make him happy, her expression gives away the sorrow that stems from the fact that her time with Sihael is about to meet its end. As she continues to stare at his bright golden eyes, she wonders if she would have ever met the crown prince had Sihael not turned into a wolf. The prince notices the pain in the way she looks at him and calls out her name, making her giggle nervously and state that although she is supposed to feel happy about the whole ordeal, she can't help but feel a bit sad. She later admits to herself that she never expected to get this attached to someone, and realizes that this is the reason why they tell you not to foster a pet without sparing it a second thought. At night, as she lies in her bed with Sihel right by her side, he wonders why she keeps staring at him, only to learn that she's trying to imprint him to her memory so that she never forgets him, even if it is inevitable that they won't be seeing each other ever again. The prince wonders why she's talking as if he's dying, and although she answers it with a soft chuckle, in her heart, she knows that she won't get to see him ever again once he imprints on Liliana. With this sadness still plaguing her heart, she caresses Sihail's face and places a soft his on his mouth, smiling gently as she bids him good night and a hearty goodbye. Meanwhile, the wolf only stares back at her without uttering a single word. Rosetta wakes up in the morning with a certain heaviness on her chest, which makes her wonder if Sihail is sleeping on top of her once again. 
While still dazed, she tries to push him away, only for her hand to hit against something harder than her wolf's soft, fluffy fur. She continues to feel it against her palm, in hopes of figuring out what it is, only for a familiar voice to tell her she should stop touching already. As she opens her blurry eyes, the sight that meets her sends her into a state of shock. Right before her lies Sihael in his human body, holding her hand and greeting her a good morning. Just as she begins to scan him from head to toe, wondering how it happened, she realizes that he's completely naked in her bed. The realization makes her yell at him to cover himself up as she throws the sheets towards him and gets off the bed. Sihael tells her to calm down, only for her to yell out in a frenzy, wondering how he expects her to stay calm when he's in such a state. A moment later, as the prince wraps himself in the sheets, he approaches a distraught Rosetta who asks him how he's suddenly human again. He says that he isn't sure either, and it might be because the poison has run its course, making her curse herself for going through the trouble of finding Liliana. When she doesn't say anything further, Sihael calls out to her, gaining her attention, and asks if she thinks he's handsome. Although she wonders how he can ask such a shameless question when he's dressed in nothing but bedsheets, she can't help her mouth from immediately agreeing that he is. Rather, she wonders where her beloved chubby Shasha is, since the male lead is particularly toned. Noticing her firm gaze on himself, Sihel dramatically hides himself with his arms, telling Rosetta that her gaze is unsettling while a perverted smile plasters his face. Rosetta immediately denies thinking of anything perverted and tells him to avert his gaze instead, making him remind her how she did do something perverted when she groped his bare chest a moment ago. Calling it an accident, she quickly barges out of her room, telling him to stay inside while she goes and finds Renoa. As soon as she shuts the door behind herself, Rosetta succumbs to her knees, wondering what she should do now that Sihael has turned back to human way before she imagined he would, and that too, completely naked in her bed, contrary to how she imagined she would meet him, fully clothed and by Liliana's side. As she bangs her head against a nearby pillar, cursing her fate, she fears that he may have imprinted on her a thought that is enough to terrify her to the core. She then recalls from the novel that imprinting is usually done in two stages. First, a spirit mentally imprints on someone when he feels undeniable love and affection for his partner, and second, they get physically involved. Once the physical step is completed, the imprinting is said to be perfectly carried out. What confuses her is that they have done neither, and that the kiss she shared with him last night could come nowhere close to the love and affection that is needed for imprinting. Just as she's thinking hard over this problem, Sihel appears from behind her and drapes a gown around her shoulders, telling her to cover her nightdress otherwise she'll get cold. It only pisses her off, and she scolds him for stepping out of his room shirtless, reminding him how bad things could get if somebody sees him like this. As she shoves him back into her room, ignoring all his cries of protest, she finds herself heating up on the other side of the closed door, finding it necessary to wake Renoa right away. When she reaches his room, she finds that her lazy brother is still sleeping and proceeds to use violence to wake him up. Once he's wide awake and yelling at her in all his fury, Rosetta tells him that the prince has suddenly become human again. Still a bit dazed, he wonders if the witch has arrived, only to learn that she hasn't and that the prince is suddenly human again. When Rosetta wakes up and finds him right beside her, startled, he stutters, asking if he was in her bed when she woke up, to which she nods her head, sighing and rambling on about how shocked she was when she opened her eyes, and the first thing that she saw was his bare chest. This revelation makes Renoa grab his sheathed sword and wear a menacing smile as he prepares himself to annihilate one particularly perverted prince. He further declares that he has always known that the prince was a pervert, otherwise he wouldn't even sleep in her bed. As he begins to march out of his room, Rosetta holds him back, telling him that nothing of that sort happened between them. As he continues to badmouth the prince, the duchess grabs the sword from his grip and tells him to get a hold of himself and fetch a fresh piece of clothes for the prince. He sulks and refuses to look after him, only to change his mind immediately when Rosetta makes him realize just how strange it would be if a barely dressed man is seen leaving her room. He proceeds to leave the room and instructs his sister to stay where she is for the time being. As she tells him to hurry up so they can greet him properly, Renoa smacks his fists together with a menacing look on his face and tells her to rest assured. Meanwhile, Sihael sits in Rosetta's room, still covered with merely her bedsheets, while he thinks back to her extremely flustered face from when she woke up and smiles to himself, admitting that he has never seen her so embarrassed before. Finding it extremely adorable, he swears to himself that he'll soon find a way to make her his, now that he has imprinted on her. He then recalls how he woke up in his human body last night to nothing but utter shock, 
and deduced that it could only mean that he felt enough love from Rosetta earlier that night that he successfully imprinted on her. Even though her love was mostly for Shasha, the kiss she gave him left a profound effect on his heart, either way, to make him revert to his original self. As he walks up to the window and stares out of it, picturing the beautiful face of Rosetta, he tells himself that he has to go from where they currently stand in their extremely complicated relationship, in which she only sees him as her beloved pet and nothing more. On top of it all, now that he's human again, he fears that she might grow wary of him especially once she learns about the fact that he has, in fact, imprinted on her. This is why he has to be careful and methodical in his approach and make her his before she even knows what hit her. Right then, the door knocks, and he turns around excitedly in hopes of greeting Rosetta, only to find Ranoa standing before him in her stead. He questions why he, of all people, is here, making the annoyed man simply state that it isn't like he wanted to come either. He then questions if he tried to do anything to his sister, making the prince dramatically whimper and state that he is the victim here, making Ranoa wretch in distaste. On the other hand, Rosetta stares at the ceiling in the hallway, wondering what will become of Liliana and Sihael, now that he has reverted to his original form without her assistance and without imprinting on her. In fact, he turned human even before he got to meet her, which makes her wonder if they'll be able to fall in love with each other like they did in the novel. However, she quickly brushes it off, assuming that they'll figure it out on their own either way since they are the novel's leads. Just as she takes a deep breath in, Sihail's voice steals her attention as he calls out to her and presents himself fully clothed this time around, leading the Duchess to praise his looks and welcome her. He asks if she thinks he looks good in this style, making her exclaim that he would look good in whatever he wears when he has a face that pretty. Their conversation is, however, interrupted by Ranoa as he clears his throat <clears throat> and explains that for now, he has told everyone that Sihail is here to recuperate for the time being, but yet he still can't deny that the servants are extremely confused about his sudden arrival. Sighing, Rosetta says that the butler will take care of this matter, and as she settles down on the bed, she asks the prince to not just stand there and take a seat. She instinctively pats the cushion right next to her, only for him to sigh and chuckle at how she still thinks of him as her pet dog. Rosetta immediately lets out a gasp at this realization. However, he doesn't seem to mind it too much, and proceeds to take the seat that was offered, only for it to get snatched from right under his nose by Renoa. As the brother sandwiches himself between the two of them and thanks his dear sister for the seat, Rosetta wonders what he's doing and tells him that there isn't enough room for three people to sit. Still a bit annoyed, he simply tells her to bear with it as he takes out a magical sphere and reveals that he's contacting their older brother, Reynold. As soon as the contact is established, Reynold expresses relief upon discovering that the prince has returned to his original form, and Sihael greets him back, wondering how things are at the royal palace. He reveals that the empress initially wasted no time in spreading false rumors about his ill health far and wide. However, she has been rather quiet lately. He guesses that she's staying put and biding her time until the emperor's birthday, and wonders when the prince plans on returning to the capital. Before Seahail even gets to respond, another man appears behind Reynold and yells at the prince to return to the palace at once, threatening to hand in his resignation otherwise. Seahail addresses him as Gale and tells him that he can perfectly manage those tasks himself, further revealing that he cannot return immediately since he has found something interesting to occupy himself with over here. He then takes out the remnants of the chimera he faced in the forest and wonders how the Empress will react when she learns that they have all been annihilated by his hand. As both Gale and Reynold question, if it is a chimera, he reveals that they were sent by the Empress into the mountains near the Razel state, and that both he and Rosetta barely escaped their attack with their lives. Hearing this brings a glare to Reynolds' face and he asks if something happened to his sister, only for the lady to join the conversation and reveal that she's fine and that the prince was merely teasing him. As Renoa also proudly states that no chimera could hurt his sister, Reynold praises them both for their hard work before telling the prince to let him know when he'd be back in the capital. Renoa, who is shocked and disappointed by his brother's reaction, tries to argue that he cannot just leave them with his praises and that he must come and take the cunning prince back to the capital. His protest, however, is only met with silence. So as he tries to re-establish the broken contact with his brother, Sihail and Rosetta decide to step outside. Later in the day, Rosetta watches Renoa gulp down bottle after bottle of alcohol as they have lunch on the table. She recalls how, ever since he realized that the prince wasn't going anywhere for the time being, he quit eating and has been chugging alcohol. 
She wonders why he even bothers to come out and sit at the table when all he does is drink, but as soon as she glances at the unbothered Seahel eating his beloved apple pie, she realizes that he's targeting him and decides to keep glaring and scowling at him until he runs back home, something that isn't going to happen either way. Feeling his usual glare on him, the prince asks him not to be hostile toward him since they're going to become very close very soon. Hearing this only angers Renoa further, as he tells him to quit barking like the dog that he was, making the prince chuckle and state that it is inevitable because it hasn't been long since he regained his human form. Renoa states that if that's the case, he should have stayed a wolf since he isn't even a tiny bit cute as a man. The prideful prince chuckles and tells him that he hasn't noticed his charms yet before turning to Rosetta and asking if he's handsome. In a heartbeat, she tells him that he is indeed very handsome, making Renoa wonder if it is only the face that matters to her. At the end of the day, she simply answers that the body matters to her too, which is why she is called C.I.L. Handsome, a declaration that makes him bite down on his words. The prince then reminds him how he promised the wine cellar to him once, which makes the redhead instantly claim that his dirty trick won't work on him again. However, his resolve breaks as soon as the prince states that he'll allow him to take as many wine bottles from the said cellar as he would like. As Rosetta is left in awe of the wine cellar's power, Sihail takes a piece of apple pie and offers it to her, wondering if she would like to have some. A little too weak to the power of the apple pie, she immediately opens her mouth to be fed by the prince's hand, only for Renoa to grab the fork from him at the last minute, and roughing turn Rosetta's face toward himself, shoving the piece of pie into her mouth. It expectedly infuriates her and she lands a well-deserved punch across his face. Later on, as she berates him for making her jaw sore, Renoa yells back and states that he cannot stand the sight of the two of them, acting like lovebirds all the time. She calmly listens to him and wonders if he's drunk, telling him to sleep it off if that's the case. However, the calm only lasts a few mere moments and she immediately grabs his collar and shakes him back and forth, ingraining it into his mind that there is, in fact, nothing going on between her and Sihael. As she reinstates that they are only friends, the drunk redhead turns to Sihael and tells him that it seems like he doesn't have a chance. Hearing this, Rosetta yanks him back to the floor and turns to the prince, stating that they don't need to listen to his trash talk. The prince, on the other hand, wears a broody expression on his face and agrees with her idea, stating that they indeed need to throw him somewhere. The intimidation in his eyes startles her, and she wonders what he means by it. The prince casually states that he meant to throw him into his room. As he finishes his lunch and leaves the table, Rosetta is left to wonder why she saw a murderous glare in his eyes a moment ago. Later in the evening, Nanabi is shocked to see that the prince has returned to being human, which makes her wonder why he chose today of all days to do so. Seahale states that he isn't sure either and that it just happened out of the blue. Rosetta admits that she indeed feels terrible about all the extra work that they had to put into discovering Liliana, but realizes that she still needs to ask about the heroine of the story. That said, she asks Nanabi where she is and learns that she's waiting in the living room. Standing up from her seat, she decides to pay her a visit either way and asks Sihael to come along, hoping that the two of them can reconcile whatever has been ruined by her. She also understands that imprinting cannot take place between these two now, but even so, she wishes that something would change when they see each other in person. Their meeting with the power sorceress begins in a rather trivial manner, as the lady introduces herself as Liliana Manu, and Rosetta finds herself feeling blinded by the very light of her existence. She realizes that she's just as bright as her name, and just as beautiful as she imagined, before proceeding to explain why they needed to see her. However, as soon as the Duchess begins to tell her about Seahel's poisoning and curse, he lays his head over her shoulder and begins to run his head against her neck, making everybody fall silent for a brief moment. Rosetta immediately shouts at him for behaving imprudently and asks what he's trying to do, only for him to wonder if he can hold her hand immediately. He further explains that he needs to hold her hand, since he's scared of checkups, making her wonder why that could be possible, given that he's the prince. However, he instantly turns to Nanabi, who has been to battle with him and asks her to let the Duchess know that he truly has a ton of fears. The mage flinches under his gaze and stutters as she backs him up, knowing full well that he's merely bluffing and has nothing that scares him, let alone a mere checkup. In the end, she gives up and takes his hand, while Liliana holds his other hand for the checkup. She's left to recall how soft and fluffy his paws were when he was Shasha, but now that he's human, his fingers are rather lean and slender. As she glances at his face, she finds that his cheeks have turned red, 
which makes her wonder if he's sick, only for him to groundlessly blame her for it, leaving her dumbfounded. Right then, Liliana releases C. Hale's hand and states that she has completed her checkup and has detected no signs of everlasting effects of the poison. However, she has detected a slight hint of a spirit in his blood, almost as if it belongs to the devil, which has left her to wonder how a human could have the blood of a devil. Sometime later, Sihael and Rosetta are sitting in the lush gardens outside the palace, deep in conversation with Liliana, as they stare at her in a state of shock due to the words she has just uttered from her mouth. He looks at her with a mischievous look on his face, asking if she can actually detect some sort of demonic blood coursing through his veins, and Liliana tells him that she can sense other interesting things as well. She reveals that she can sense something strange brewing between him and Rosetta, and the heavy burden that it is causing. Rosetta is too stunned to speak upon hearing this, as she glances at Nanami, hoping that she will help her better understand this situation and Liliana's cryptic words. She turns her attention back to her guest to find Sihel towering over poor Liliana, menacingly lifting her chin up, as he warns her that her blabbering mouth and her careless words will get her in grave trouble if she isn't careful. Rosetta is disappointed to see that the original male and female leads of the novel who were destined to be star-crossed lovers seem to deeply despise each other as he continues berating Liliana, telling her to never dare to cross the line again. She only stares at him sternly in response, finally blurting out a quick apology. Sihel sits back down with a loud grunt expressing his frustration <sighs> as he signals to Nanabi to escort Liliana out instantly. Rosetta watches as she quietly leaves the room, as she feels embarrassed by his behavior, since they were the ones who had called upon Liliana in the first place, and now they had kicked her out so rudely. She confronts him about his rudeness, thinking that at this rate, the chances of Sihel imprinting on Liliana are near zero. Rosetta's conscience is eating her alive, so she decides to say a proper goodbye to Liliana. But when she gets up from her seat, Sihel grabs her wrist and inquires where she is off to. She explains how she wants to bid farewell to their guest, and is met with a dumbfounded expression on his face, as he asks her if that is truly necessary. Rosetta's blood begins to boil at his total lack of manners, as she thinks how he would be considered to be such a rude man if she wasn't always by his side cleaning up his mess. She tells him that as the hostess, it is her duty to ensure that her guests don't leave her place full of repulsion toward her, so she wants to clear up any misunderstandings with Liliana. She rushes out of the gardens to seek out Liliana, whom she finds walking near the mansion gates. When she sees Rosetta approaching her, she bows her head and immediately begins apologizing for her hurtful comments that had offended Sihail earlier. But Rosetta interjects, saying that she should be the one apologizing for his impudence. She explains how he is usually not so uncivil and that he was just in a foul mood today, and Liliana brushes off all her apologies, saying that she didn't mind his harsh words since he was correct. Rosetta is relieved that she isn't deeply offended by the rude exchange and watches as she lifts her arms up signaling for her to hold her hands. She places her hands in Liliana's palms without any questions asked, as she uses her powers, and tells Rosetta how her blood is just as unique as Sihail's. She elaborates that her blood is prone to attracting monsters, and that she has the same special blood running through her veins. This explains a lot, as Rosetta realizes that the reason why Sihail had run off to Liliana and imprinted on her in the original story wasn't because of some stupid pheromones, but because he had followed the seductive scent of her unique blood. She warns her how this uniqueness had only caused her harm, as she had never lived a moment of peace in her life. She warns Rosetta to keep a distance from Sihael, telling her that while her blood might be beneficial for him at the moment, it will soon become his poison, and she will have to deal with the terrible consequences all alone. That night, Rosetta returns to her room feeling absolutely defeated as she crashes into her bed and curls up into a ball, thinking about the harrowing words of Liliana. She thinks about her past month in the mansion, how everyone refers to her as a helpful tonic since she has assisted many people around the place, including Sihael, by offering her blood for his healing and sustenance. She is terrified to think that her healing blood might take the sinister form of a deadly poison and bring harm to him, and she is certain that Liliana is telling the truth due to the frightful expression on her face. Afraid of accidentally killing Sihail, she becomes determined to distance herself from him so that he can become the great emperor he is destined to be, and she can continue living the rest of her life peacefully. 
Sometime later, C. Hal approaches her in her bedroom where he finds Rosetta still depressed about their grim future, and he asks her if Liliana has something to do with this sudden onset of despair and gloom. She was expecting to spend some quality time with him before he left for his duties at the Imperial Palace, but Liliana's sinister prophecy had ruined all her plans. In an effort to console her, he gently pats her back, telling her to not believe any nonsense, but it is impossible for Rosetta to not take Liliana's words seriously since she is aware of her great powers as the talented female lead of this novel. She is suddenly reminded of the resolution she had made earlier as she stops bawling her eyes out and swiftly gets up, which startles Sihael as he flinches away from her. She tells him that they need to have a serious conversation, but seeing his shaken-up state offends her even more, as she asks him if he found her face to be scary. He is totally flustered and at a loss for words at this point, and he admits that he did find her a little intimidating at the moment. This seems to be the last string for Rosetta, who explodes with rage as she grabs a nearby pillow and flings it at him, and the two become surrounded by feathers raining down around them. When she finally calms down, she realizes her grave mistake as she finds him lying in bed clutching his shoulder, as if he is in great pain. She is in disbelief that she let her emotions control her to this extent, as Sihayel slowly rises back up, saying that she broke his shoulder. Rosetta has her heart in her throat as she apologizes to him again and again, flailing her arms around helplessly. A sly smirk spreads across his face, and he is unable to hold back his laughter, still shouting that his shoulder is in excruciating pain as he puckers his lips and tells her that only a kiss can make him feel better now. She realizes that he is tricking her and plays along with him, leaning in for a kiss as she suddenly grabs his shoulders and starts jerking him around. Sihael realizes that she has caught up with his lies, so he drops the facade and makes her trip, and the two of them come crashing down on the bed. After finally pinning down Rosetta, he exclaims that being this close to her has done the trick and fixed his shoulder as she watches him from a distance, feeling annoyed at his antics. Soon afterward, they both turn serious and bring the teasing to a halt as he inquires her about the conversation she had with Liliana. She repeats the grim prophecy about how her blood will eventually poison him and she will meet her downfall, most probably at Sihel's hands. Rosetta informs him that Liliana only gave her cryptic answers that only confused her even more, which reaffirms his beliefs about this whole prophecy being utter nonsense. He tries reasoning with her, saying that if he was still in his wolf form, the prophecy would make more sense since he used to be obsessed with her blood, but in this human form, he had no thirst for it and no intentions of becoming a cannibal. However, Rosetta remains adamant that Liliana's words hold some truth to them, and she is convinced that he will become addicted to her blood at some point in the future. He reassures her that even if he were to get addicted, he would try his best to overcome it. And if he fails, then she can simply take care of him, just as she had beaten him up and carried him around during his wolf days. Rosetta is shocked to hear this, as she had planned on keeping the training days a total secret from Sihail. But he tells her how Renoa had already filled him in about the brutal practices she used to apply to him. Suddenly, he grabs her face tightly in his hands and tells her that she has the power to beat him up anytime he misbehaves, so she shouldn't worry too much about their future. Rosetta is taken aback by his sudden forwardness as she smacks his hands away, saying that she can no longer hurt him since his identity as the crown prince has now been revealed to all. Sihael reminds her about her sheer strength, telling her that she is still the strongest person in this mansion and is capable of taking on several people at the same time. She insists that distancing themselves from each other is the safest option available for them both, but he tells her that he has another plan that will ensure her safety, explaining that he will simply avoid her blood at all costs if that is what is supposed to bring their downfall. Sihael's reassuring smile finally convinces Rosetta, and she agrees to the plan as he offers his hand to her, asking to go on a walk. The duo heads outside for their stroll in the gardens, and they soon reach the pretty bushes adorned with colorful flowers as they are surrounded by the gentle sounds of rushing water. Rosetta walks ahead of Sihael and is busy admiring a bunch of roses as he slips his hand inside his pocket and pulls something out. Suddenly, he begins proposing to her as he prepares to pull out the ring, but she turns around to sit on the ground by the roses, which makes him lose all his confidence as he tells her that he was just offering her a handkerchief to sit on. Rosetta grabs the piece of cloth from his hand and places it next to her as she signals at him to come sit down with her. Sihael's ears turn bright red as he is hit with a crushing wave of embarrassment. He plops down next to her and covers his face with his hands to hide his tomato-like appearance. 
Once the two of them have settled, they begin having random conversations to pass the time as she is busy making a flower crown, gently twisting a branch and attaching delicate flowers all over it. He's mesmerized by seeing Rosetta's slender fingers hard at work and he asks her what she is making. Rather than giving him an answer, she finishes up making the crown and places it on top of his head as she flashes up a bright smile at him and tells him that he should consider this as an early coronation ceremony. He stands up immediately and begins walking toward a nearby flower bush. Excusing himself for just a moment, however, he returns after quite some time as she waits for him patiently. Cihael approaches her and puts a flower ring on her finger, telling her that he isn't talented enough to make something as complicated as her flower crown, so this is all that he can manage. Rosetta stares at the ring up close with wonder in her eyes, wondering where he learned to make such delicate rings and thanking him for the heartwarming gift. Seeing her appreciation for the gift, he immediately begins making a dozen more of those rings in an effort to impress her, despite her insistence that one is good enough. Rosetta asks him if she smells like anything special to him, which takes him by surprise as he gets distracted from his task at hand. She elaborates by asking him if she smells as enticing to him as she used to back when he was a wolf, and he simply replies that she always smells nice, complimenting her current floral scent. She is delighted to learn that she doesn't smell like anything special to him anymore, as she is relieved that he doesn't have any interest in devouring her alive like before when he was a wolf. She continues her questioning by asking him if he had noticed anything special about Liliana's smell from earlier, and Sihael recoils back in disgust, unable to believe that she would think he was capable of doing something so perverted. It seems like Rosetta is still adamant about making sure the original male and female leads of this novel end up together, and she is concerned that he hasn't made any progress in growing any romantic feelings toward Liliana. Meanwhile, Sihael is hard at work as he finishes making another ring and puts it on her finger when Rosetta asks him if he has any past experience with women. He straight up denies ever having any kind of romantic relationship with a woman, and she is in disbelief that a man so charming and affectionate could spend his teenage years without ever coming near a woman. He fires back the same question at her, and she tells him that she would never settle for some ordinary man since her standards are quite high and she would only want the best for herself. Sihel hesitantly asks her if he meets her standards, and she tells him that he has raised her standards even higher, so she is probably going to go on with her life without ever finding a partner. She informs him about her plans to adopt a cute puppy and live by herself all alone, but Sihel interjects, saying that she will never be alone as long as he is by her side. Rosetta tells him that they are just friends, and he lets out a loud groan which perfectly expresses his disappointment in this situation. He turns his back to her saying that they aren't friends, but something much closer and deeper, and asks her if she still considers them to have a pet and master sort of relationship. Rosetta exclaims that she considers him a fully functioning human being, but it seems like the damage has already been done, as Sihael gets up and announces that he will be finding a new master for himself, someone that she doesn't know. She calls out to him saying that she isn't ready for him to leave yet, and he tightly pinches her mouth shut, saying that she needs to be taught a lesson. He storms out of the garden, asking her to not talk to him right now leaving Rosetta by herself devastated among the roses. Rosetta's sulking is interrupted by Ranoa, who stumbles upon her in the palace by herself. He asks what she is doing all alone, which makes her slowly rise from the ground in her haggard state, as she tells him that she prefers being in solitude, with an unconvincing expression of misery on her face. He immediately realizes what's going on, and knows that something must have happened between her and Sihael, which would explain the depressed aura that surrounded poor Rosetta. He asks her what she could have possibly done to offend the man who is willing to sacrifice his life for her. She lowers her gaze, feeling guilty, regretting her words from earlier, especially considering the fact that they will be getting separated soon anyway. He advises her to stay away from Sihel until he has left for the capital, but she is completely opposed to this idea, since she wants to savor the last few days she has left with him. Ranoa says that she shouldn't worry about getting separated from him since she will be going to capital with him anyway, and this comes as a surprise to her since she has no plans of doing so. He reminds her of her coming-of-age ceremony that was soon approaching, which was coincidentally happening right after the Emperor's birthday ball. Rosetta says that she will just have a simple ceremony right in the palace, and she is instantly met with an uproar from Ranoa, which startles her as she ducks down in fear. She complains about his loud screaming, but he becomes incredibly agitated as he shakes her around trying to knock some sense into her. 
reminding her of how much she had wanted her ceremony to be arranged in the capital, going as far as to say that she would rather die than throw some pathetic ball in this palace. She smacks his hands away, saying that she doesn't want to have a lavish party in her name anymore, and he admits that she has changed way more than he thought. They decide to stay at the palace until the ceremony has taken place, and just have a relaxing time at home. She is thankful that her brother will be by her side to accompany her, as he too believes that going to the capital will only get her involved in corrupt politics. Moreover, Rosetta is concerned about the Empress, worried that she will attack her for hiding away Sihael at her home for such a long time, and her brother agrees, saying that the Empress will surely rip her apart if she ever comes across Rosetta. She recalls how in the original story the Empress had a friendly relationship with Rosetta, but in this life, she had a target on the back of her head. Renoa is impressed by her smart thinking as he pats her on the head, which annoys her as she pushes him away and asks him to not treat her like a child. He remains unfazed, however, as he even remarks about her deathly glare, saying that it has softened up as well. The siblings begin fighting as she starts pulling his hair, but their squabble is interrupted by Baron Falia, who soon arrives at the scene with a bunch of documents in his hands. After they're done exchanging greetings, Falia asks them how they've been doing, and Renoa instantly starts ranting about Sihel. Falia says that he is aware of the Crown Prince's stay at the palace, and Rosetta immediately asks him to keep this news a secret. Falia is amazed by her clever thinking, saying that he is proud to see her using some common sense finally, since the Rosetta from the past would just scream and throw tantrums till she got what she wanted. Noticing Falia's high spirits, she asks him the reasoning behind his bright smile, and he excitedly announces how Ashila, the jeweler, has agreed to sign a contract with them. She claps her hands in celebration, delighted to find that the business idea she had proposed is coming along well, as he thanks her for her hard work. She shrugs off all the praises as he hands her all the paperwork, and suddenly announces that she will be accompanying him to the capital soon. Her heart drops upon hearing this news, as the siblings exclaim in unison, they have just been discussing staying at home for a while, and now, Falia is here to ruin their plans. Falia explains that Ashila had agreed to sign the contract on one condition, that Rosetta must come to the capital and supervise the work herself. Rosetta is still reeling in shock as she tries persuading him that she is just the figurehead, the name attached to the project, and that he was supposed to do all the actual work. But when she finally glances at the contract in her hand, she finds her own name signed at the bottom of the text in bold letters. Falia says that since it was her brilliant idea to hire Ashila, she should be the one who sees this plan through, and that he would never take credit for her amazing ideas. Rosetta secretly wishes that he would just be shameless and take all the credit for himself, as she only cries in misery thinking about the burden of responsibilities that will soon be put on her shoulders. She tries sweet-talking him in a desperate attempt to make a new contract, but he insists that he truly believes in her skills and expertise. Rosetta wonders what skills he is talking about, since her only contribution to this project was to give a random idea and sign some papers, and she deeply regrets ever doing so. She grabs his collar and menacingly threatens to hurt him, and Falia presents her with another document in an effort to get her off of him. He informs her that Ashila has promised to make an earring and necklace set for her coming-of-age ceremony to start off their new business relationship, and Rosetta's jaw drops when she sees the design, as she admits that the gift will be a good promotion as well. As soon as Falia sees a glimmer of hope, he runs off with the papers, and she is left behind shouting at him to come back. She falls into her brother's arms and begins weeping, the reality of her situation finally hitting her like a truck. The next day, Marina finds Rosetta slumped in a corner still neck deep in her misery, as she shares her worries with her, saying that she doesn't want to go to the capital, but she would also feel guilty if she declined Falia's offer now, because she would feel like she is throwing away all his hard work down the drain, and also wasting the huge sum of money that they will surely be making from this project. She also thinks that wearing Ashila's gifted jewelry to her coming-of-age party would be an amazing way to advertise her business, and Marina reassures her that she will do a splendid job as always. She firms her resolve and decides to be brave and face her fears, as she calms herself down thinking that it will only be a short visit to the capital. She decides to arrange her birthday party at the capital like it was originally intended, hoping that she will reap as many benefits as she can from this trip for the sake of her business. She walks over to see Hale's room, after confirming that he has been locked up in there since last night, and she wonders if his anger has subsided after a full night's sleep. However, Rosetta believes that he is the one who misunderstood the relationship between them and got his feelings hurt, so she doesn't want to continue walking on eggshells anymore and wants to become friends with him again. She knocks on his door and calls out his name, 
but she is met with dead silence from the other side. She pushes the door open and steps inside, only to find that the room has been turned upside down as everything is a mess with clothes covering the floor and the furniture knocked away. She immediately suspects a burglary and thinks that the thief has the guts to come steal from them in broad daylight. And as she turns around to ask Marina to alert the guards, she hears someone's shoes loudly tapping toward them on the marble floor. It turns out to be Nanabi, who is rushing at them at full speed, and she zooms past them inside the room, maniacally searching the drawers for something. When she doesn't find what she is looking for, she excuses herself and sprints back out of the room, and Rosetta and Marion decide to follow her, hoping to get some answers for the urgency. When they finally catch up with Nanabi outside the main building, they find her panting and frantically looking around as she tells them that she had discovered a hole in the magical barrier she had created to protect the Chimera pieces she was studying, but now the Chimera fragments were gone, so Sihael had gone to investigate who had stolen them. Nanabi senses something strange nearby and realizes that something is going on near the incinerator. Rosetta connects the dots and realizes that the thief must be trying to destroy the evidence and burn it all away, and she quickly sprints in that direction to catch the culprit red-handed accompanied by Marina. When they finally reach the incinerator, they find a young boy kneeling next to it staring blankly at the burning fire right in front of his face, and they watch as he pulls out a gold bag full of the Nanabi's chimera fragments. Rosetta orders Marina to stop the boy from burning the evidence, and she instantly pulls out a couple of daggers and skillfully throws them at his hands, causing black blood to ooze out. The boy looks up at Rosetta with bright red eyes, making her wonder if he is even human. She asks Marina how these monsters keep finding a way inside the palace undetected, and she replies that she will ensure such an accident doesn't happen again. Nanabi snaps her fingers, and a transparent, dome-shaped barrier appears over the group as she informs them that it will shield everyone and everything outside. She tells them that the boy is actually a demon in a human form, which is an extremely rare find, and her eyes light up at the thought of taking the demon to her labs and studying it. The demon opens his mouth to reveal three pairs of menacing eyes staring into Rosetta's soul, and she watches as three snakes begin slithering out of his mouth. The snakes start conversing with each other, saying that they were given permission to eat if they got caught, and Rosetta asks them who their boss is despite being sure that it is the Empress. The snakes crawl near her and announce that they will be feasting upon Rosetta first since she looks the tastiest, but Marina and Nanabi jump in front of her to defend her. Rosetta feels safe in their presence, as Nanabi has dominated many battlefields as a powerful sorceress in the elite army, and Marina is a trained elite assassin. Nanabi throws a huge magical ball of energy at the snakes, hoping to kill them all in one blow, but they seem to be extremely resilient as they rise from the smoke completely unharmed. She is shocked that such a powerful blast had no effect whatsoever on them, and Rosetta informs her that the Empress must have made them especially resistant to her kind of magic. Marina steps forward with a menacing look on her face as she leaps high up in the air and comes crashing down on top of the snakes, wildly swinging her daggers in all directions and chopping off the bodies of the snakes into little pieces. However, to their utmost disappointment, the snake pieces soon start attaching back together, surprising Marina with their incredible rate of regeneration. Rosetta gets an idea and she steps forward next, grabbing one of Nanabi's daggers and aiming it at the demon boy instead, flinging it at him with incredible accuracy. This seems to do the trick, as the snakes recoil with pain as soon as the dagger hits the demon, and Rosetta lets the other two women finish the job and clean up the mess. Nanabi summons a giant tornado of fire from the tip of her staff and blasts it toward the demon, which greatly weakens the snakes. When the dust around them settles down, Rosetta realizes to her utmost horror that one of the snakes had somehow crawled up her body and was wrapped around her limb as it bites her hand, injecting its venom in her vein. She freaks out, and wildly jerks her arm around, thrashing the snake against a wall and finally knocking it out for good. She approaches the other two snakes and continues beating them up, as Nanabi and Marina watch from a distance, surprised that her bare hands are doing the job that their powerful skills could not. Rosetta brushes off her hands and wonders why they are so weak, as Nanabi informs her that demons who have the ability to communicate are considered to be extremely smart. She approaches the three snakes again, asking them which one had bit her hand, making them cower under her deathly stare. She realizes that the magical blood oozing out of her wound is putting them in a trance, and she spares their life and makes them crawl back inside the demon boy's mouth 
As Nanabi plans on torturing them to get information, they hear a sharp tearing sound coming from behind them and turn around to find Sihel ripping through the barrier and approaching them with a long sword in one hand and a decapitated monster head in the other. Rosetta asks him where has been, and he tells her that when he went to investigate the broken barrier, he discovered another demon there, and after dealing with it, he immediately rushed back to ensure that she was safe. He points at the boy lying on the floor, saying that he is the real culprit, and once he learns that the boy is responsible for stealing the chimera pieces, he moves toward him to deal the fatal blow. The boy crawls toward Rosetta, wrapping around her leg and begging for mercy, and this scene instantly boils Sihail's blood as he sarcastically asks her if she has adopted a new pet already after him. Meanwhile, the boy continues pleading as he refers to Rosetta as mistress, which infuriates her even more. During this chaos, Sihail notices the bite marks on her hand drops everything and rushes toward her, lifting her hand up for closer inspection, asking her if she is all right. He catches a whiff of her blood, which instantly makes him lose control. But just as he is about to lick her wound clean, she covers his mouth with her other hand and moves away from him, telling him that they should keep their distance. He snaps back to his senses soon and is instantly filled with guilt as he turns around to leave with a defeated look on his face, saying that if he stays any longer it might be dangerous for Rosetta. Rosetta's suspicions are confirmed by this chain of events, as she realizes that Sihel still has a thirst for her blood despite becoming a human. She kicks the demon and asks him if the snakes that bit her are venomous, and the boy replies that they are not. Marina senses he is lying, and she threatens to decapitate him if he doesn't tell the truth, and he immediately spills the secret, saying that the venom only caused mild fever and pain. The boy is dragged away by Nanabi, who promises to get the exact information out of him to create the perfect antidote for Rosetta, and Marina safely escorts her back inside the palace to treat her wounds. Rosetta's health quickly deteriorates until she is forced to lie in her bed all day burning with fever, as she curses the demon for bringing her to the brink of death with such a small snake bite. Nanabi and Marina are present in the room with her, as they devise plans on how to torture the demon and banish him to the deepest pits of hell. Their constant chattering only adds to Rosetta's annoyance, but she is soon rescued by Renoa, who barges in and orders them to get out of the room and leave her alone. Sometime later, she is approached by Sihael who stares at her worriedly from the doorway, and she downplays her terrible state by saying that she only had a minor cold. She inquires about the boy, wondering if Renoa has murdered him already, but he informs her that the demon is being held captive by Nanabi who is busy interrogating him using various methods. He asks her if she is fond of the boy, considering that she had stopped him from killing him earlier. She tells him that she spared his life to learn more about the secrets of the Empress and the reasoning behind these incessant attacks aimed at her. But Sihael remains unconvinced. He sits next to her in bed and gently strokes her forehead, asking her what she plans on doing if she ever gets in danger because of him. Rosetta jokes that her only viable option would be to run away as fast as possible, and he asks her if he should chase after her or let her go in that situation. He admits that Liliana had been right all along as he has slowly realized that he was really capable of causing harm to her. But Rosetta reassures him that she was not afraid of him whatsoever. Sihael finally begins unveiling the twisted thoughts that his demon blood instilled in him, as he tells her that every time he sees or smells her blood, he wants to devour her entire body until there's not a single hair left. He feels ashamed of these thoughts, but he has no control over them. As he calls himself scum and asks her to forget about him, Rosetta shrugs off his concerns regarding her safety as she tells him that she is highly capable of fending for herself, saying that she will pummel him if he ever dared to attack her and bring him back to his senses. She moves closer to him and pinches his cheeks in adoration, making him burst out in laughter as he admits that beating him back to his senses seems like a viable strategy. Sihail returns to his office and busies himself with work, where he thinks about Liliana's prophecy and how everything she had said was solely turning out to be true. He knows that he will be unable to control himself the moment he sees Rosetta's blood again, and he knows deep down that there is something sinister lurking deep within him. When he had told Rosetta about his wild hunger and his desire to consume her whole, he had only told her part of the truth, deliberately keeping an important part to himself. It is then revealed that Sihael also feels incredibly possessive toward Rosetta, and a dark part of him also desires to have complete ownership of her. He feels extremely trapped in his own body since he is unable to comprehend and control his own thoughts and feelings. His anxious brainstorming is interrupted by a knock on the door as Renoa enters the study and tells him that he wants to have a talk with Ciel. 
Renoa inquires about the recent attacks and learns that they were all targeted at Rosetta, as Sihael informs him that the demon he had recently beheaded was also looking for her. Renoa is infuriated by this news, as he blames him for all the misfortune that Rosetta has had to face recently and informs him that all this chaos had begun the moment he had entered her life. He tells Sihal how she used to be a cheerful kid, but her entire personality had shifted once the demons began assaulting her, turning her into an extremely bitter person. Rosetta had started to grow kinder once again, but Sihal's arrival had ruined everything as she had been thrown back into the chaotic life she had always feared. Renoa instructs him to guard Rosetta and protect her from all harm, which takes him by surprise, as he was fully expecting the protective brother to kick him out of the palace. Renoa tells him to not get too involved with her and simply act like her knight, and Sihal jokes how the crown prince has been demoted to the rank of a mere knight in the blink of an eye. With a look of utmost determination on his face, he places his hand on his heart and swears to protect Rosetta from all harm, no matter what it takes. Once the pact has been made, Sihel asks him if he plans on accompanying them to the capital, and Renoa informs him that he has his own business to attend to at the capital, so he will be joining them on the journey. Sihel raises his concern about the Empress, saying that she will definitely notice his presence there and take action against Renoa, but he seems unfazed by her threats, as he plans on doing something mischievous, before the Empress even gets the chance to attack. Speaking of the capital reminds Renoa of Sihael's promise about letting him have all the wine in his cellar at the royal palace, and he assures him that he will be allowed to have as much wine as he wants for himself. The next day, the demon boy somehow escapes Nanabi's prison and approaches Rosetta, begging for his life to be spared. However, before he can get close to her, he is lifted up and flung across the room by Sihael, who is dutifully guarding her. He approaches the boy and asks him to apologize, and he immediately gets down on his knees with an innocent pout on his face, as he wholeheartedly apologizes for hurting Rosetta. She finds it quite strange that a demon would ever apologize for his crimes, and she considers keeping him around since he might prove to be useful in the future. Sihael is opposed to this idea, and he wants to immediately kill the demon, since all the information that he could provide has already been extracted from him. Hearing these menacing threats makes the boy leap into Rosetta's arms as he wraps himself tightly around her body and begs for mercy. She cries out for help and tries prying him off of her, saying that he should be trying to kill her and not beg for mercy, since they were supposed to be mortal enemies. However, the boy insists that they are on the same side and even refers to her as his friend, and Rosetta asks Nanabi how old the demon really is. She learns that he is only as old as a ten-year-old human, and she feels sympathy for making a child go through so much suffering. The boy grabs her arm and tells her that he can take care of her, but Rosetta remains highly unconvinced, as she is reminded of the snakes and what their venom has done to her. She asks him for his name only to discover that he has none, which makes sense since the Empress wouldn't be concerned with naming the demons she hires to do her bidding. She announces that his name is going to be Rumian from now on, which seems to be a mistake, as his mouth instantly pops open and the three snakes crawl out and begin arguing about which one of them gets to have the name. She looks back at Sihel and Nanabi for help, but they turn their heads away from her and she realizes she will have to deal with this mess herself, since she was the one who had decided to show mercy to the demon. She brings everyone's attention to herself, and tells the snakes that they will be named Ru, Mi, and An respectively, which brings great joy to them as they begin dancing in celebration. She instructs the snakes to remain inside the boy's mouth, and the snakes surprisingly oblige, crawling back from where they had emerged. The prince tells her that she is too good for her own good, warning her that demons are hard to tame, and that their natural instincts might take over any moment and the snakes might hurt her again. Rosetta asks him if he is okay with having the boy around for a bit longer, and he replies that he won't object to it, if that is what she really wants. She asks him the reasoning behind his despise of the little demon, wondering if it is because he has been sent here by the Empress. He reveals his true feelings, and admits that the reason why the boy upsets him is that she has grown fond of the demon, and he is afraid she will forget about him soon. He asks her to promise that he is still her favorite pet, and she simply nods in response, which puts a bright smile on his face. Rosetta reaches out to Baron Falia next, informing him that she will be leaving for the capital with the crown prince soon, revealing that she had originally planned on staying at that palace and keeping her distance from the Empress. But now that the Empress was sending demons after her every other day, it was best for her to stay at the capital where she would be closer to the rest of her influential family. Her ultimate goal is still to lead a happy and peaceful life, and if she has to jump into the eye of the storm to achieve that dream, 
she is willing to make the temporary sacrifice. Falia suggests she attend the Majesty's birthday ball, wearing some of Ashila's jewelry, saying that it will be an amazing promotion for the business, since a bunch of rich and famous people will be attending the event. Rosetta is hesitant to attend this prestigious event, especially since Falia would be there anyway, but he insists that her presence will definitely turn everyone's heads her way due to her reputation. After much consideration, she makes up her mind and decides to attend yet another risky event, hoping that it will all be worth it in the end. There's still plenty to uncover about the conspiracy weaved by the Empress and about the truth revolving around the Prince's curse, but this is how this segment of this manhwa ends. If you liked this story and want us to continue, please leave a comment down below with the name Rosetta.